Hi, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. Uh, in this video, we're going to discuss baptism with Christopher Lampa. Um, he is coming all the way from Finland. He's seven hours ahead of us. I'm at noon. He's at, what, 7 p.m.? And uh, he has put together... Now, to give you a little background, we've been doing the Full Stature Initiative. We're about two, two discussion sessions into it. And in the last one, Christopher had some really interesting things to say about baptism. He's obviously looked into this issue a good bit. So I have asked him to come back on and share some of his findings with us directly. Now, as we do this, um, I don't know what he's going to say. I don't know if I'm going to agree with it, but that's the same thing. I, I, I want to listen to this and just consider it as input. I think it's going to be edifying. And if nothing else, we'll know more about this when we're finished listening to it. So with that being said, um, let me go up to bring us all in together. So this is Christopher. Welcome aboard. Thank you very much, sir. All right. So um, you want to, I guess, maybe just take about a minute or so and kind of tell us a little bit about yourself so we know who we're hearing from. Right. So uh, my name is Christopher Lampas, as you already said. Um, I'm uh, 31 years old. I have a wife and three kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I work as a commissioning manager for um, a company that makes big diesel engines and a lot of the equipment around that. Um, and then uh, I also, well, I'm, I'm a Christian. I grew up in... Um, a revival movement within the Lutheran church in Finland, of all things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this also has its counterpart in America. It's called the Apostolic Lutheran Church, and there's okay. some connections between those two. Um, and that's also, I would say, um, so, I mean, English is not my, my native tongue. Uh, I did, however, back in 2008, I went to the States because of this connection with that church. Uh, and I spent three months there in South Carolina, North Carolina, and then in Michigan. So I think uh, that's where I picked up a little bit. I mean, you, when you when you interact with native speakers, you kind of you uh, try to get your language. That sounds, <laughs> sounds You're doing good. great. Uh, I'm from... I I'm from the Southeast U.S., Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Texas, a lot of places like that that I've lived, and uh, you're doing most, you're doing better than most Americans I've encountered. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you're doing great. Um, yeah. So, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's that much to say. I mean, I I like to read and and think about stuff, and I guess that's that's what I'm doing mostly. <laughs> All right, sounds good. I'm I'm gonna. So we have this. We have the presentation brought up here that you put together, and uh, if you have it open on your end, I guess you can just tell me what slide you want to talk about, and I'll go to it so everybody can see it. And if you want to bring up scripture, I can I can bring that up as well. So I'm right. just gonna I'm just gonna let you start talking. Tell me what you want me. Which slide you want me to show and uh, talk us through it? Okay. So so first of all. Um, I just want to say that um, I didn't really discover this myself. Um, I'll, I'll tell you shortly about what happened. Is for a long time I'd been thinking about the baptism, and then specifically mm -hmm. then about water baptism. And as you know, the Lutheran Church is pretty close to the uh, Catholic Church, and I mean it's right. it's a sacrament. So so you, I mean, there's this baptismal regeneration stuff going on mm -hmm. now from that revival movement that i come from it's it's a little bit um some some kind of belief like that and and then some see it more as a symbol something you just do i mean they don't really think that much about it anyhow okay. I, I it was i was starting to think about this and i actually i saw i saw a video by david poss and i thought okay this Okay, it's interesting. I was talking about the spirit baptism. And um, I'd heard one of his series on, called Men for God, which I thought was really good. But then when he came to the baptism, he said, okay, so now you have to get baptized in water and then you'll receive the spirit. So he was obviously kind of taking his uh, theology from uh, Acts 2.38. Uh -huh. 
And it kind of didn't sit right with me because, okay, I was baptized as a child, but right. at least in my family, like we didn't, I mean, we've always thought it's, it's the faith that's important. I mean, that you have faith. I mean, so I was thinking, and then one night um, I was listening to some uh, Messianic Hebrew worship and the thought just struck me. It was, okay, so what do Messianic Jews think about the baptism? And so I searched for that. Mm -hmm. And then I came to a site. And, and so this, this is the guy that put up the site. And, and he's kind of been working on this for a long time. So I just want to put this out here. So uh, then I realized that the Messianic Jews doesn't really, they don't really differ. It's kind of like, hmm. A little bit like bap, uh, Baptists, like they they'll have the okay. Credo Baptism. So uh, many yeah. of them. Of course, there could be some variants there that I'm totally unaware of. But I mean, mm -hmm. I stumbled upon this site, and I started reading, and I realized that he had a perspective that I hadn't seen anywhere. So, so I mean, everything that I'm going to say tonight, I've I'm fairly convinced of. I might be wrong, and so I really enjoy the chance to put this out. I want to say, uh, yeah. let's really try this and test this and scrutinize it. Um, I really welcome it uh, from anyone Absolutely. watching and from you. Uh, so, I mean, if there's any credit that should go somewhere, that's to the uh, his name is Hanuk Ben Keshet. Um, I've <laughs> I've just been reading what he's been you know writing kind of looking at it from all kinds of angles that I can. And, and yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, yeah, I wanted to put that out first. Okay. Um, and yeah, wow, well, let's <laughs> dive right into it. I was thinking about yeah, sure. the, uh, the, the title and I didn't really, didn't really know what to put, but so I put baptism <laughs> cognates, expanding the meaning of baptism. And then yeah. kind of like, it sounds academic, but it's very interesting when you start thinking about it because it, if it's true, like, so I'm going to play, I mean, I'm going to talk like what I believe. And I mean, I'm going to put it out from the perspective, what I see when I read the scriptures. Um, so from what I see, if this is true, it, it does have some implications and yeah, not, just, not it's just very interesting. Cause every, every Christian, regardless of denomination, has something to do with baptism, has to mm -hmm. have some kind of opinion about it, or they have a practice of baptism. I mean, bap I think everybody is related to this issue in some way or another. So yep. yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. Yeah, and I, I don't want to offend anyone on either side of the spectrum, but I'm, uh -huh. I'm pretty much going to trample on everyone's toes. Let's do it. Uh, when when <laughs> we get into it. So toes. yeah, let's, let's take the first or the second slide. Um, so obviously there's a need for humility. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, um, there, there might not be a doctrine that has been more divisive in church history than the doctrine about baptism. I mean, they even, they even drowned Anabaptists when, when that time yeah, came did. around. So, I, I mean, it's rebel in those guys, right? Right. And all, yeah. And, and around, uh, the code of Justinian 529 AD, uh, condemned rebaptism, which was, they would people who were practicing credo baptism if you were baptizing somebody who had already been baptized as a baby that was a capital offense you could be put to death right. for baptizing somebody after they believe if they were already baptized as a baby <laughs> yes yeah and uh so if you start i i just took three i mean there's there's much i mean there's the roman catholic view there's the southern baptist it's the reformed view is different yeah, yeah. you have the end and and, uh, and even among uh, the reformed there's differences there right right yeah um but i mean if you look at let's say roman catholicism kind of represent one of the sides which is we're talking about clear baptismal regeneration reborn in the in the water baptism right um they also then have the 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 doctrine about um, original sin, which then, right. at least according to Augustinus, uh, that gets get washed away in the water baptism, and then yeah. water baptism actually confers the spirit baptism. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So that's that's kind of like as I see it, one end. Uh, then I would say the other end is like uh, if you look at the Southern Baptist Convention, 
that's where you kind of have a pure credo baptism, which is you come to faith and you do this as an act of obedience, symbolizing the believer's faith. Um, yeah, so I want to clarify a couple of terms for people listening. When when we say words like credo baptism or credo baptism, sometimes sometimes I only see it with one E. So people are going to say pedo baptism, which means baptism of children or babies. Right. And then credo baptism means the credo means belief, which means you only baptize people who profess belief. Right. So when you hear these terms pedo baptism and credo baptism, it's really, do you baptize people as babies or do you baptize people when they believe? So that's what those two terms mean in case in case those are 50, 50 cent words for anybody listening out there. Yeah, that, that's, that's good that you point yeah. that out. Right. But anyhow, I, I see that kind of as the, the other um, end of the spectrum that you have. So it does, it, you don't, you don't become reborn in, in water baptism. It's a symbol. Uh, you do it out of obedience and so on. And okay, the Lutheran view where I come from, that's, that's pretty close to the, the Roman Catholic view. So there you also have, uh, at least, I mean, if you look at Luther and what he's writing, you have baptismal re regeneration. Um, and of course it depends on how people, how they, um, what they focus on, but, but, but in the end, we have quite great variants and opposing views and um, very strange, like if you read the scripture that you have all of these different views. So then what I wanted to do, if you go to the next slide, yeah, um, I kind of wanted to, to set the stage for like, how could it, how could it be that something like this came about that we kind of find ourselves with a plethora of, all these kind of views. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we discussed in this, uh, um, the last session was that uh, we can see from Acts that they go through view, um, stages of learning. And, and you have kind of like Acts 10 and 11, you have Acts uh, 15, where there's kind of new revelation, at, at least being introduced to the reader, they, they know, and I think also for the disciples, uh, one thing that that comes about in Acts 15 is that the Gentiles don't have to convert to Judaism in order right. to believe in Christ. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, does, does a Jew have to become a Gentile when he uh, believes in Messiah? Which I would say both of these, I think, has been under, misunderstood. Like in the beginning, uh, there was some Judaizer, Judaizer that tried to convert any Gentile to yeah, I mean, you had to um, circ get circumcised. Uh, but then then we've clearly seen also uh, Jews being forced to abandon their Jewish uh, Jewish uh, customs. Uh, for instance, in the, what's it called? The, the Roman Catholic Church had the Inquisition. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, for instance. Yeah, it's interesting that you would say that. It never really occurred to me that a Jew would have to become a Gentile. Um, we don't see that in the Bible at all, especially like in uh, in Acts twenty one, they're still practicing Judaism, you know, right? Still going to the temple, still pra still doing the vows, still doing the t uh, sacrifices and everything, right? Um, and so, I, I, well, I do yeah. want to point out real quick on your slide, it it's probably a Finlandism uh, for yes. English speaker <laughs> that K O R uh, out of the corner of my mind. Before I looked right at it, I thought it was reference to the Book of Kings. Yeah, so <laughs> it should be a C in English. My C is a C in English, so uh, I'm gonna change that real quick. If that's all right. Yeah, right. Um, just so some of our native English speakers don't get confused about what that reference is. So actually, right, a par parenthesis is um, I live in Finland, but my mother tongue is Swedish. So there's about three hundred thousand oh, wow. uh, Swedish-speaking Finns living in Finland. I do speak Swedish and Finnish, uh, Swedish better than Finnish. But yeah, that's that's um, how we uh, spell it in in Swedish with, with a K. Well, that's at least two more languages than I can speak. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I studied um, Spanish, and then I moved to Italy, and I tried that, and then I now I can't speak either one. <laughs> I know, I'm not gonna it's try like any of those. The other one. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, um, what I think is that uh, at least it's clear. I think most people would agree that Gentiles don't have to become Jews. But then uh, let's look at the Jews. I mean, 
for our salvation as Gentiles, it, we don't have to get involved with any of their customs. Right. But Jews, uh, the question is, should they become uncircumcised if they were circumcised? And Paul is saying, if, uh, if you are called uh, being circumcised, don't become uncircumcised. I don't know how a person would do that. <laughs> no, but I mean, he does mention in the the, the, the verse after that yeah, yeah, circumcision that. is nothing. But you don't have to. Um, they didn't have to pretend to be a Gentile. I mean, they could be a Jew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Yeah. And and one point about uh, Acts twenty one. So you have Paul and he shaves his head and he goes to the mm -hmm. temple and he brings the sacrifice and he even pays with them. And it also says about the Jews, uh, brother, you see there's a, is it 10,000 Jews that, that follow the law. And then um, mm -hmm. I think one thing we have to remember is that you had the 12 disciples that were strictly for Israel. Now, you can't have them going on about and start behaving as Gentiles in Israel and start are um, doing whatever, that would be the worst kind of witness you could have for other Jews. Yeah. I mean, if you consider, let's say, Deuteronomy 18, uh, where it says if if a prophet comes and and uh, the things that he says, let's see what it says. Yeah, they don't it's come in, to pass. Uh, no, if it does come to pass, it says, no, Deuteronomy 13. So it says, yeah. Uh, if a prophet comes or a dreamer of dreams and give it the sign or wonder and the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, let us go off to our gods, which thou hast not known, let us serve them. Thou shalt not he hearken unto the words what, of that what prophet. What passage is that? Deuteronomy 18? No, 13, sorry. And then it's from... Uh, yeah. Uh, What's the verse? It's the beginning of, of the chapter there. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I, no, I just want to I want to bring that up so people can kind of follow along a little bit. Right. And then it says, verse three, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or of that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And it says, ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep yep. his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him. Uh-huh. So in a Jew's mind, even if a prophet came and he did all of these signs and wonders, if he, for instance, told them, no, you don't have to follow the commandments of God, they would yeah. not follow that way. And yeah, yeah. I, we even have Jesus saying that not a single, um, I, he hasn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So it's just something I want to bring in there that you can see that. Yeah. Right, you Where take that, that up. It's good. Five, seventeen. Yeah. Yep. So he's not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And he yep. says, "Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one th tittle shall not in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled." Right now, imagine the the testimony it would be if uh, the twelve apostles and the believers, the, the um, Jewish believers in in Messiah started uh, breaking the law in front of the the face of the whole israel yeah i mean that would be uh, devastating yeah it would be very now, disruptive for sure right now what happened then um was that the temple got destroyed in in seven seventies um the jews were persecuted and what happened quite quickly because firstly there was more jews that believed than gentiles and of course, they were they were making sure that um, I mean they they understood the context where Messiah is coming from. So for them, it was it's our Messiah, it's the Messiah right. of Israel. He's the King of Kings. But yeah, then, like somebody else is hijacking their Messiah, <laughs> right? But then yeah. then you kind of have the turmoil, and I think some historians even called it the the tunnel period of the church, where you have the destruction of the temple. Uh huh. And you have more more Gentiles uh, coming to faith, and 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 suddenly you have a lot more Gentiles believers than Jewish. Right, right. Um, and some some uh, theologians and and commentators, for instance, on the Book of Rome, uh, they think that 
Paul is actually addressing uh, an issue between Jewish and Gentile believers in Rome. So oh yeah yeah that's that's uh, that's a version I've had, and I, I kind of I kind of think that they they might have something, something going. Yeah, right. That's interesting. Yeah, it, wouldn't, it, it, it seems like it goes along with it. Yeah. Right. So now, if if we're taking this into context, that that you have this happening, um, then if we start looking at the church fathers, progressive, and I put it in in quotes, understanding. Yeah. Um, I think that quite quickly you see things creeping in that weren't intended by the originals because I know that w when I start saying or, or kind of uh, mentioning the things that I think that the text is saying, some people might say that, okay, what about the church fathers? Like they were baptizing in this way and that way and they were believing like this already like 30 years after John died, so the, the apostle John. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's, I think where the call of humility is needed because I mean, even the disciples, well, there even was the already error in the new Testament, right? There's Hymenaeus and Philetus and Alexander. There's, there's Diotrephes. There's already error. So when people go back in time and they're like, this is only 10 years after the apostles. Well, during yeah. the apostles, there was yes. error, but, yeah. you know, they, they talk as if there's zero error. I mean, there's error in Acts 15. Yeah, you know they have to go correct it. So there's, uh, they people talk about church history as if during the period of the apostles there is zero error. Then suddenly, magically, that you know it appears later. You know, yeah. but no, there was error the entire time, and so it, it did not magically go away right when John was about to die. Um, so just because somebody says something during the life of the apostles or directly after doesn't mean it's correct. It still needs to be checked with scripture. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So, um, uh, if you take the next slide, um, I have two slides, I think, not three on the church fathers and early texts. And, and there's a few things I want to point out there. So now anyone who knows greek and so on if if i'm butchering this <laughs> pronunciation don't be be have some grace with me but didache or didache i don't know how you pronounce didache, that i think is how most people pronounce that word the didache. right so that's that's a very early uh writing which at least mm -hmm. is said to be the combined teaching of the apostles right. of israel yeah that's what the word means is the teachings right now teaching yeah let's and this actually talks about baptism but here, we have an issue here it says but before the baptism let him that baptizeth and him that is baptized fast and any other also who are able and thou shalt order him that he is baptized to fast a day or two before yeah you don't find that in the scripture no no you don't and so that's um that's very interesting that you have this demand not just for the guy who's getting baptized or the girl, but also the one baptizing and anyone witnessing it a day or two before. Yep. And looking at, for instance, uh, uh, Any, Peter's... So anybody just witnessing it too. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Right. Um, okay, and it says who are able, of course. It doesn't command that you have to... You don't have to do that. But in my mind, it's like... I, I don't think this... Uh, yeah, it, it's a it's an issue. Um, at least, let's say you you have the the Peter when he's preaching on the uh, the Pentecost. Uh, mm -hmm. He says that three thousand souls were added that day. I mean, I'm quite yep. sure they didn't have time to fast. That's a good point. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So that's a good so, point. I'm just saying that. Okay. Uh, it's, probably yeah, it's there's amazing so how traditions creep in and modify these things. Right, I, and I mean, there's there's good points probably in the Duche, but but that one's an issue, and because mm -hmm. of that, so let's say Paul Paul had a lot of problems with the apostles who call themselves apostles but are not, mm -hmm. and I think I think we have to be aware that such persons could have crept into church history, become church fathers, and written a lot of stuff, and a lot of it is Absolutely. probably good. Yeah, right there in Second Corinthians chapter eleven, mm. um, we have false apostles. I'm going to bring that up just in case somebody's unfamiliar with it, to show that 
there's a very clear warning in Second Corinthians chapter 11 that there's going to be people coming preaching another Jesus, receiving another spirit, or having another gospel. And he's mm-hmm. afraid that they might bear well with him. Yep. And then later on in the same chapter, he says, uh, some of these guys are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now that was going on while Paul was alive. Yeah. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And of course, you do not want your end to be according to your works. You want it to be according with the imputed righteousness, which is by faith, not by your works. Because well, we learn in Romans 3 that getting uh, getting judged according to your works does not pan out well. No, it does not. So yeah, that's that warning, very clear warning. Indeed. And that's a really good point. Um, looking next, then you have, and this is this is considered to be uh, year 100 to 140 after Christ, is you have the shepherd of Hermas. Now, mm-hmm. um, I don't think, I don't know if they count him as a church father, but it's a very early writing. Now there right. it says, it is because your life is saved and shall be saved by water. So mm-hmm. there you have the thought already coming in, that your life is saved by water. Yeah. And now, of course, anyone There's knowing no Jesus wasted all that blood then. <laughs> well, yeah, that that's 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 one point. Um I mean, if looking at baptismal theology today, I mean people, of course, would understand that okay, it's it's true water with the word or however you want to see it. But okay, the thought is there quite quickly that you're being saved by the water. And of course, of course, they believed that it was Christ that died for them, but it, it's something about the water that's that's happening. And then you have uh, Barnabas, uh, even potentially earlier, and there you have water. Um, so we go down into the water full of sins and raise up, bearing fruit in our heart, resting our fair hope in Jesus by the Spirit, meaning that uh, the baptism takes away the sin. Yeah. If you go to the next slide, um, mm-hmm. yeah, so there we have Justin the Martyr. Uh, and I think, well, I think both of these quotes are, are, are good, I think. Um, there we also have instruct to pray and entreat God with fasting for the remission of sins that are past. We pray in fasting with them. Um, and then the second one. Well, I'll uh, then, hit on that for just a second. Right. They instructed to pray and entreat God with fasting for the remission of sins, of their sins that are past. Now, that is a misquote from mm-hmm. Reve- uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 25. And the idea is this, this word there is not in there. And so when people see the remission of sins that are past, they are thinking, let me go to, let me bring that up real quick. Um. When people see the remission of sins that are past, Romans 3, they are thinking of their own sins that are past. And that is not what the writer has in mind here. Sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Because what's happening, if I could, uh, to show this worded a different way, the remission of sins that are past, it's because of the sins that have been remitted in the past, and that past is before Christ showed up historically. That would be yep. the 4,000 years worth of sins that have been remitted without a proper basis to remit those sins because Christ had not yet died and risen again. Now, if I go to Hebrews chapter 9, around verse 13 or so, um, it talks about the blood of bulls and goats purifying to the sanctifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living true God. And for this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. Hmm. So when you see the phrase in Romans 3.25, for the remission of sins that are past, that is not the remission of the individual sins that he has already committed. It is stating that Christ is the only proper basis for the actual remission of sins that has been going on with the blood of bulls and goats for thousands of years prior. Those sins that are past. 
Anyway, I just wanted to point that out and show that even go back to over here in this slide, even even Justin Martyr. So people misuse that phrase today, mm -hmm. um, thinking it's the individual sins that they've already committed. And you can see how he's misusing it by inserting the word there, yep. there, showing possession. And that's not what Romans 3.25 is talking about. So people do it today, and apparently Justin Martyr was doing it around 165. So... <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, that's a good point. I didn't, I didn't know about that. So that that's really good. Now, right, go the, ahead. Yeah, the second quote is then, then they are brought by us where there is water, and are regenerated in the same manner in which we were our self regenerator. For in the name of God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, then they receive the washing with water, and may mm -hmm. obtain in that water the remission of sins formerly committed. So there you have. Again, the misunderstanding, good. the misapplication yeah. of Romans three twenty five. Right, and you even have uh, water uh, regenerating them. Uh, at least that's how it looks when you, when you look at the stuff at the text. So, I mean, this is even more, I would say, uh, clear in 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 that water. So, so you've shown stuff from eighty to one twenty, and then one hundred to one forty, and then ninety to one twenty, and now we're at one sixty five. Right. And, and then Justin Martyr saying stuff like this. Yeah. And then we jump uh, to the next guy who wrote a whole treatise uh, called the De Baptismo. Um, and I didn't take all the quotes that we can find about baptism here, but now it gets really crazy. If you wanna if if you wanna stay biblical, don't don't follow up any of this stuff, I would say. Um <laughs> Um, yeah, this is a in, good disclaimer. I should probably have a disclaimer statement on here that <laughs> we are not we are we are not endorsing the quotes that we are putting on the screen. We're just showing you what people have said in the past. Yeah. So so this is the progression. Now you now you're at one sixty to two twenty, uh, and so that's that's a mere two hundred years after the apostles. And now I I want to point out some things here which I think is very, it kind of at least jumps out. At me, um, I mean, just just happy is our sacrament of water. So there you have already this, the, the talking about sacrament coming in, uh, in that by washing away the sins of of our early blindness, we're set free and admitted into our eternal life. So there you again, like little fishes, we are born in water. So this this idea that we're being born in the water, and that. Uh, that were set free and admitted internal life is happening in the, the water baptism. Now, jumping to chapter four, uh, says there's no distinction between those whom John baptized in the Jordan and those whom Peter baptized in the Tiber. All waters, therefore, in virtue of the pristine privilege of their origin, do after invocation. So there you have the invocation of God, attain uh, the sacramental power of sanctification for the spirits immediately supervenes from heavens and rests over the water. There's his, he's quoting back to Genesis, the, the spirit resting over the water and sanctifying them for himself and being the sanctified, they imbibe at the same time the power of sanctifying. So there you have the mixing of water and the spirit for some odd reason. So I want to jump in there for a second. Um, the uh, the word sacrament does not appear in the Bible. Mm -mm. So the word sacrament gets worked in from the outside. And if you, it, it, in, I might be mistaken on this, but the word sacramental means to confer grace. Let me see if, let me see if, uh, huh. if, uh, no, it won't let me look it up. Smart look up. Um, relating to constituting sacrament of the sacraments, sacramental meaning, well, observance analogous, but not reckoned to the sacraments. Anyway, that's not really what I'm trying to get at here. But the point is the, the idea of a sacrament is something that confers grace to somebody. Yeah. Um, you'll find in like Baptists, and I'm not necessarily saying that we should do it this way. Baptists will say, look, in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 11, 2, we have this word ordinances. Mm -hmm. And then 
later in the chapter, after he talks about the woman's head coverings, he talks about the the Lord's Supper, okay, later on. But he uses the word ordinances. So you'll see Baptists say things like, we don't have sacraments, we have ordinances, and we have two ordinances, and they're the Lord's Supper and baptism. Well, mm-hmm. the Bible never actually calls the Lord's Supper and baptism ordinances, okay? So that's, I think... Baptists are kind of doing a stretch by saying that that's necessarily scriptural, but maybe as a convention, not as doctrine. But for sure, there is nothing about... (laughs) What am I trying to say here? There's nothing about these things that confer grace. They are to remember, to show, that kind of thing. They don't actually confer grace. They're not sacramental, and I think Mm. that historically the idea of something that a physical practice that you go through conferring grace really comes from paganism. Yeah. And so as, as you are putting Christian, you're Christianizing pagan practices, suddenly sacraments to work their way into Christianity. But in the Bible, there, there are no sacraments in the Bible. Um, especially not in the new Testament, nothing no. that actually confers grace to the person. So the ceremonies that we go through are, ceremonial markers are more for a collective way to remember and embody things that we hold most dear. They don't actually do anything metaphysical for the person in a, in an empirical sense, if you will. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's good about the sacraments. I, I think, I think that's actually what it means that it confers grace. I am, um, or that that's the intention when, when they mm-hmm. use that. So now, if you look, is intended yeah. to confer grace, yeah. And I think I think that this idea has crept into the the collective mind of the church already. Then I don't know how widespread it was, but at least when he's writing what he's writing, Tertullian, then at least that's the idea he's getting. Um, so I, I this chapter six um, quote here. Um, so he's not saying that they obtain. The Holy Spirit. Okay, let's let, let me read it. Not that in the water we obtain the Holy Spirit, but in the water under the witness of the angel. And then suddenly there's an angel witnessing the baptism happen. We are cleansed and prepared for the Holy Spirit. Thus, too, does the angel, the witness of baptism, make the path straight for the Holy Spirit, who is about to come upon us by the washing away of sins, which which faith sealed in the name of Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit obtained. So there you have kind of like a an interesting idea, which I. I I'm arguing that you can't find at all in the scripture. Like we're getting in my mind, very far from what we can actually read in the Bible. Now, one point I would like to point out here is that six times in the new Testament, there's a distinction made. Yeah. This this distinction verse chart down here. Right. So this distinction is made that John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy spirit. And if you look at those uh, six verses, you'll see that it's either uh, John saying that, okay, I baptize you in water, but the one that comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So I just find it very interesting that three times uh, it's being pointed out and made a distinction between John and water and Jesus and Holy Spirit. Yep. Now, if we go to the next slide. All right. I was going to put that back like it was, but I'm going to leave it. <laughs> ah, yeah. okay. Then um, what I like to do then is, okay, so let's get, th- so this was kind of setting the stage for quite a long time for, okay, so what, what do I think and what do I think we can see in the Bible looking at this word, which is baptizo? Uh-huh. First of all, uh, on this slide, uh, there's a few quotes from, uh, I don't know that all of these are uh, contemporary. I don't know. I mean, you, you can look at the dates. I think it, it should say if, if you're looking for those quotes uh, from when they're um, so when you, they're done. So when you say contemporary, for those listening, we're, we're looking at people who we think are contemporary with the New Testament writers. Yes. Or right around that time frame contemporaries mm-hmm. with them so how yeah. was the word being used historically at the time how would somebody at that time understand this word yeah and um 
one of the meanings, uh, I later have a, a lexical entry that we'll take a look at, but um, what they used this word for was being drunk. So you were whelmed with undiluted wine. Right. And then whelmed is the word baptizo. Um, and the next one, the next quote, I mean, there's there's tons of these quotes. I just picked a few just, just to get it there. Um, and then before they're completely overwhelmed, again, overwhelmed is baptized, provided by contributions and tickets. Um, and then actually you have Plato saying, for I myself am one of those who yesterday were overwhelmed and he's, uh, he's talking about that he was drunk yesterday. Uh, then you could be overwhelmed with anger. And he, whelmed by anger, sinks and desiring to escape into his own realm, is no longer free. Or you could be overwhelmed by grief. Now, one way to think about this, by looking at an example... So you could, we, be, so you could be baptized by grief. Yeah. You could be baptized by anger. Yeah. Or you could be... Baptized. But I, yeah, and I think I think it's it's better that yeah. we actually use the word overwhelmed or whelmed because I think that's what so that's how they translate like this. It doesn't say baptized in the in the English text of this translation. It's, it says whelmed. Because, so in a in a movie that came out in the movie Three Hundred that came out in two thousand seven, uh, there was this place where it's describing the Spartans and it says when the boy was born like all Spartans he was inspected by the time he could stand he was baptized in the fire of combat mm. taught never to retreat never to surrender to the death on the battlefield in service to Sparta was the greatest glory he could achieve in his life yep. so even today outside of religious circles people understand that word to be fully immersed into something that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with any liquid at all. Anyway, now, that stood out. It always stood out to me when I saw that movie. <laughs> that that that's a really good. Yeah, that's a good good one. It, it's a it's a it's a contemporary to us usage because yeah. that movie came out in two thousand seven. Yeah. Um, and then back here, they're doing the same thing. They're using the word "baptized." to be immersed into something and they're not even talking about a liquid at all. Mm. So so what they're actually so that, so just to get it right is what they're doing in Greek they're using the word baptizo and that word is then being translated to whelmed or overwhelmed in this place so this quote it's just being pointed out so the sources are in the bottom so there is a PDF copy of the books there's two books uh, okay. where those quotes are are uh, um, taken from uh so in that book it's so it's, it's a book about uh baptizane. it's a meaning of of the word baptizo baptizane. and then uh the the author is just pointing out that okay so this is what baptizo means and here's how it's being used now for some reason now, a lot just, of i might cut this out of the video later but just to ask you would you be okay if i made this presentation available on the website for free yeah for sure absolutely yeah, yeah, I'm going to yeah. post it. If if you're okay with it, I'm going to post it as a PDF. I'll probably put your name on it, created by Christopher Lampa. No, and that's then, okay. uh, I want That way people can look through this and they can study it on their own. Yeah. So if you're out there listening and you want this information, don't feel like you have to screenshot all this. We're going to put it on the website as a PDF on the class notes page, and you can go download this and mm -hmm. read it and study it at your convenience. No, and – I could also put a point if if it's if it's okay with you. So that website, uh, www.benkeshet.com. So yeah. if you just go to that one, uh, there you have about three hundred thousand words on, on on baptism and stuff relating to that. Wow. If you so wow. I really, I mean I I think the best because this guy Hanuk, he's he's put all of this out he's not pushing it out he just put it there because he's yeah he wants people to read it and then you know see is this something that could make sense yeah, um, absolutely. right now i wanted to take a, a an ex example of, of how we would use a word today that would kind of be used the same way and that that's the word drunk so okay. so if if you think about it you can say the the man is drunk by the wine yep and the wine is drunk by the man that's true right so you have 
But but what I want to point out is that yes, the word drunk it means that he's okay. He he drank the wine. The man drank the wine, and now he's drunk by the wine. That means mm -hmm. that he's intoxicated. Yep. But you can also say that someone's drunk by love or something yeah. else, drunk and then yeah, yeah. it has nothing to do with the act mode of drinking. It only has to do with the intoxication. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're not even looking at mode because you don't think okay, he's drunk by love. He probably drank a love potion or something. No, you just know that okay, he's drunk by love. So, I mean, yep. he's love sick. Um, uh, and so I think keep that in mind when we dig now. <laughs> If you take the next slide, um, this is a lexical entry by Schnabel. Schnabel, I don't know how to pronounce that, language of baptism. Uh, and uh, so that's how you find that. Uh, now, it's very, I don't know if it's going to be visible on a smaller screen, but I'll just read um, the physical uses. Um, trying to make this a little bit bigger. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite small to have on a... On a just one slide, but I wanted to get everything there. I got you. Uh, I got the same problem when I'm making slides too. I want people to see it, but I also want to yeah. kind of bird's eye view and get all the information too. And sometimes that's tough. Yeah. So now I'm assuming, um, looking at how he's made this lexical entry is that it's just looked at where the word is used and how it's used and in, in all of the context is, uh, and then he's put together this uh, lexical entry. And if we go through them really quickly, you have to plunge, to dip, or to immerse, which is, I would say, how most people understand baptism or baptize uh, today. I mean, it's kind of, it goes without saying, like they, uh -huh. they think it's, okay, it's a mode of immersion. Although, uh -huh. um, what let's say Lutherans, Catholics, they, I, they don't, um, they some of them think that uh, immersion is an accepted form of baptism, but... Um, um, but they also accept sprinkling or aspiration or something like that. But but it, it goes kind of like everyone's thinking, ah, yeah, baptizo, that means to, to immerse. But then you have second meanings of the word, which is to wash. And then I think the mode, the, the reference to the mode or, or the link to the mode kind of disappears there because you can wash something, which we'll see later in, in the Bible, and it doesn't have to be by immersion. Like the mode is irrelevant. It's the it's the result that's interesting, which is purifying or being clean, which yeah, you can the, see in the yeah, next entry. Right. right. So you have to make ceremonially clean gloss. So it's ceremonial to purify. That's important. Yep. Yes. So you have to purify or to cleanse. And then um, to drown, to suffer death, and to sink. Now, yeah, and even slaughter. So that's the physical uses. Uh, wow. Then the, fig the figurative uses uh, is to be overwhelmed or to be immersed or to be drunk. And we all already looked at this. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that there's a word that's called bapto. And I would say that word is more used for to dip, dip in or immerse. Um, and, and there's actually, so here down in, to the right, uh, I actually, no, I didn't put out the, the source there. It's, I think it's from Bible Hub. I should, yeah, I should yeah. look in where I, I copied this from the internet, just on one of these Bible I've, study I've tools. This, I've used this exact definition. Right. Multiple, I've been using this for years yeah. <laughs> to talk about this word bapto. Yeah. So it says not to be confused with baptizo. And it's the clearest example that shows the meaning of baptizo is a text from the Greek poet and physician Nicander who lived about 200 BC. And it's a recipe for making pickles, and it's helpful because it uses both words. And says Nicander says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable should first be dipped, which is bapto. So they dip yep. it into boiling water, and then it's baptized into vinegar. And that means he puts it there, and it stays there, and it's getting soaked in that vinegar solution. And both verbs concern the immersing of vegetable in a solution. And but the first is temporary, and the second, the act of baptizing the vegetable produces right. a permanent change. Absolutely. Think, so it's like uh, it, it, baptism is a it's being immersed into something that changes the quality of a person's identity. Like like yeah. you can go, you can put a pickle in water and wash it, but you put mm -hmm. it in vinegar for a few weeks, um, or I mean a cucumber. You can put mm -hmm. a cucumber in water and wash it, but you put it in vinegar, it turns into a pickle, and it can yeah. never go back. 
No. So when no, you get true. baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit, that's that's what's happening there. You're being immersed into something that completely changes the quality, the, a qualitative transformation of what what kind of being you are, mm-hmm. what kind of thing you are, and you can never go back. Yeah, and now, now you're using that word you be, that okay being immersed in Holy Spirit or being immersed, and I think well the Holy Spirit immersing the person into Christ. That that's one point to see, but okay, yeah, L- let's look at that later when we get get to it. And so you I can think, disagree with me, by the way. You feel, no, no, I feel no, no, like no. you might be trying to not disagree with me, but by all means, <laughs> no, no, I, no. But I think it's going to be clearer when we get further. That uh, I don't think I don't think that this taking the the word immersion into the context when we're talking about this is not necessarily helping us understand it. That's why I wanted to say that if someone's drunk by wine, you don't think about the drinking. So if someone is baptized into Christ, it has nothing to do with immersion. So you're looking at uh, this thing from the perspective to be overwhelmed or to be, okay, now he is using the immersed in intangible or abstract realities and consequently overwhelmed by their force. But it's not so much about the immersion, it's the effect that this baptism or baptism So instead of saying has... immersed into Christ, you're being um, permanently changed by I- identifying association with Christ, by well, associative I... identity with Christ, something like I... that. I would suggest that when we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, it's actually, uh, we could look at it as to be purified with the Holy Spirit. Okay, yeah. So, but if you go, so we've spent quite a lot of the time of just building this up. Let's let's dive into some texts. Um, I think that would be slide nine. All right. Right. Okay, very small text again. It'll look good on the on the screen, but it's uh, it's very small here. Now, uh, what I'm doing here is that um, first, before we get into those chapters, uh, so the, the 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 title of the, the slide here is John's baptism. Where is it from? Now, keeping in mind, now I use the Hebrew names of both John and Jesus because. It tends to put people in a different mindset. It kind of just opens them up that these were Jews. They were, they, they were yeah, living yeah. in Israel. So you have Johan and the Kohen, which is Johan and the priest, and he's son of Zacharias the Kohen. Now he's the lesser. And then you have Yeshua, the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, the king of uh-huh. Salem, the greater, right? Uh-huh. Now, of course, we're talking about John and Jesus. Um, in Swedish, it will be Johannes. And Jesus, uh, mm-hmm. but these were the uh, they were living in Israel. Now, looking at where could John's baptism have come from? Because there's two there's two prevailing or kind of main I- ideas that that we find if you if you start look, talking with theologians and, and reading books, you it's either that he copied a baptism from the uh, Essenes, I think it's called, mm-hmm. or yeah. that. <laughs> Essenes, I think some people Essenes, say right? In, yeah, in yeah. English that would be. Uh, or they're saying that it's uh, he copied the pr- proselyte um, purification ritual that a gentile had to go through in order to become uh, a Jew. Right. So either either of those two, and that kind of sits wrong with me because that would mean that John came onto the scene and he just. He just copied something that someone had and then started doing it. So let me ask you this, since you've looked into this, for the two, the baptisms that you've mentioned, one maybe practiced by the Essenes and maybe one practiced by the Jews who bring in Gentiles as converts to Judaism. Would you right. say that those... Um, have a doctrinal backing in the old testament or that they were conventional that just like a like a tradition or a practice that they happen to be doing like when someone a gentile converts to judaism and they and they get dipped dipped in the mikvah is that Mm -hmm. is that something that they're getting from the law specifically or is that like a conventional thing that they do at the time 
that that I don't know. I don't know if they. I mean, they had a lot of purification rituals. So I know that at least the mikvahs. Yeah, so when I when I've searched the issue out, I've I have not found anything very clear in the Old Testament about how a Gentile comes to be a Jew. You know, or how mm. you know I've not I've not seen like a like a conversion process laid out in the Old Testament, Mm-mm. and so it's it's kind of confusing. So just to get people to kind of think about this. And as soon as you say something like this, I'll, everyone's going to think that they can comment in the, in the YouTube comment section and tell you where it is, you know. Um, but what you're about to get into is the idea of where did this come from. So it is it is not clear if when they're dipping these Gentiles into the mikvah, if they have a very clear scriptural precedent for doing that or if yeah. it's a conventional thing that they are doing because of tradition and the Talmud and so forth and so on. Um, maybe a Messianic Jew would know better than I would, but I have not found anything very specific. So it's, it is very curious why this whole thing of dipping people in water suddenly pops up when John the Baptist shows up. Mm-hmm. When uh, well, I, there, there is one thing that I can say, and that is, um, again, first of all, the whole practice of self immersion in the mikvahs i would say that the, that whole concept is not necessary according to the torah well so but, let me let me throw comments on the mikvah there just in case somebody is not tracking um what a mikvah is when you hear us say mikvah all right there is a the old testament talks about washing things for purification purposes in water and the water has to be flowing or running water all right if you look Mm -hmm. in the book of leviticus and so a mikvah is um it's really a talmudic innovation in other words it is an innovative convention not a there's nothing in the old testament telling you to build a mikvah it's t- it tells you to wash things in, in running water and flowing water, which is interestingly why a lot of Jewish communities did not get the plague. And then some of the other communities thought the Jews had cursed them because they got the plague and the Jews weren't getting the plague, but the Jews were washing everything in flowing water. <laughs> That's kind of just kind of an interesting side note about history. So hmm. the need to wash things in flowing water, eventually they innovate a way to do it Whereas, hey, we're going to build this thing, which is basically like a baptistry or a bathtub or something like that, but it has water coming into it, sometimes naturally, and then it has water going out of it at some point, so so that you can technically say that it is flowing. And then instead of having to obtain flowing water every time you have to go through one of these rituals, you can save a lot of time by just having a mikvah and dipping things in it. Mm -hmm. So it is... It is a conventional innovation. A mikvah is a conventional innovation from the purification washings in the Old Testament. There is nothing telling them to have a mikvah. It is something that develops to meet the requirements of purification washings. But the the mode, if you will, of having a mikvah is not specified necessarily. It's yeah. it's it's a conventional innovative way to fulfill the requirement. Yeah, that's so that's- they would. I just want to clarify that for people. Mm-hmm. So when we say the mikvah, they would have this kind of baptistry bathtub looking thing in some synagogues where they would perform their ritual washings there and then converts would do their ritual washings there just by dipping into it um, yeah. as as representative. So <laughs> the fact that it became a ubiquitous practice does not necessarily mean that it's doctrinally wrong, nor does it mean that things in the future had to be done exactly that way. Anyway, anyway just, just yeah. some things to think about. So when we say mikvah, that's what we're referring to. Yeah, this is this is also really good. And I, I think we can add one, one more thing about this. Um, so the thing about uh, the mikvah is that... Um, they needed to contain pure water. And Leviticus 11.36 describes the water sources that remain pure. And it says only a spring and a cistern that gathers water. Now, yet later the sages interpreted the verses saying only a spring and a cistern and a gathering of water and then it's mikveh mayim. 
So this variation occurs in the Greek LXX67 and it coincides with the origin of purpose-built mikvot in the Hasmonean period. I'm quoting here from, from Hanuk ben Keshet. It says the, mini, the Mishnah requires tevila, which is self-immersion -immer in mikveh for Jewish women to be purified. Yet tevila does not occur in the Tanakh, so in the Old Testament. So it's evidently his uh, Mishnahic Hebrew. And moreover, the five books of Mo Moses never uses immerse, which is taval in Hebrew, for bodily washings. So what, are, you on, do you have, are you getting this off a slide? Right. I, I, it's, it's, uh, it's a quote. No, it's not. No, it, it, actually, I, I, did, I didn't want to put because it, there's so much text. So I have it as like a memory note. Yeah, yeah. I, see, I, I, got you. So I, the I could share those with you and people could... Um, could look into it. I'll, I'll put Yeah. The... So when he says Midrashic Hebrew, a Midrash is something like a homily or a sermon or a commentary that is written on a passage yeah. of scripture. Yeah. Um, so that kind of thing, which is highly regarded, um, semi authoritative by, by many Jews. Mm. So yeah. Talmudic is, is a real similar thing to where you have an entire body of work that is commentary on the Old Testament and considered authoritative in many. So you, when you hear words like Talmudic or Talmud, that is uh, official commentary passed down. Midrashic Hebrew is mm. uh, it's more Mishnaic. Mishnaic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I thought you were saying Midrashic, like a Midrash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that this one was Mishnaic. And okay, my bad. No. 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 I mean, uh, same thing. It's good to know about this. Um, now, the, the point was was just that. Um, so the late second temple time, so what they did, they kind of devised these perimeter fences, which is kind, kind of like subsidiary rulings to guard the mitzvot, which is the, the law or the, the commands. Yeah, the and mitzvot that's, commands, yeah. Right. So that's how the mikveh pool was, uh, was made because they, they, were, um, they were being, uh, um, what's the word? Um, oh, I'm trying to find the word. Well, they had great creativity when they read that uh, that verse in Leviticus eleven thirty six, and then they Le find liberty. out they're taking liberties, huh? right? And and kind of I don't know, maybe they were right, but but anyhow, that's that's at least how it goes in there. Because if you if you're thinking about it, when when Israel gets the the commandments from Moses or from, from God through Moses, they're out out in the desert, and they're supposed to be able to follow the commandments out in the desert where, with uh, very limited uh, water sources. Right. So it's uh, in my mind, it's very. I'm, I'm finding it very hard to believe that they, all of them, let's say a, a woman that if she was impure, that she would go and bathe and immerse herself in a water source that they found, and yeah. it's more, much more likely yeah, nobody that nobody could drink from that. Yeah. Right, and it's much more likely that because it, it does say that um, when a woman's had her period, uh, then she needs to. Um, wash her whole body. And I think also right. with marital relations, they had to wash their whole body. But it just says wash their whole body. It doesn't say, first of all, it doesn't use the Hebrew word taval, which means to immerse. It just says uh, wash. And I don't remember the, the Hebrew word for wash, but it just says wash your body. It doesn't specify you have to immerse. So, okay. Looking so then at like John. your kids, when you get dirty, go take a shower. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or go wash. And, and, and yeah. you could equally go stand in the shower or you could go in the bathtub. Just, I mean, yeah. just wash. It's fine. Now, looking at John and, and Jesus, both of them are prophesied in the Old Testament. For instance, we have Micah 2.13, and then we have the breaker, which is actually John, has come up before them. Uh, they have broken up and passed through the gate. So John is breaking the gate, and here's talking about what uh, Hebrew Jews or um, the, the shepherds, what they were doing, they make these uh, makeshift uh, pens or um, fences around the, the sheep by stone or something. And then you're breaking down the wall and the sheep would you know, go out and they'll follow their shepherd. And then what John is doing, he's, he's kind of coming, um, is describing him as the breaker and then the sheep breaking through with him and then passing through the gate and their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. So he's leading them. Mm -hmm. This is actually quoted in Matthew 11, 11, 15, 11 to 15. Actually, that, that would be a good, you can bring that up because it's, 
it's a very misunderstood verse um, in the Bible because uh, it's it's um, it's written in Hebrew and then translated to Greek and then translated from Greek to English and it doesn't make any sense. So he's talking about John and he says, from the days of John the Baptist until the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. For all of the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And this, that it's suffering violence and um, the violent take it by force, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense actually. Uh, and a better translation of that would be that from the days of John until now, the kingdom of heaven is breaking through and the breakers through, which is, so those that are breaking through with it are called breakers through. So that's that's the name, the title they get. So the kingdom of heaven is breaking through and the breakers through break through with it. So it's so, uh, just to remind everybody, just in case you're not following along, what what Christopher's doing here is he's taking the verse that's being quoted, being referenced in Matthew, and he's kind of taking this concept back into Matthew, and that's where kind of where that's coming from. I think that's also what Jesus was doing, but they had they had some trouble. Uh, what you can do, you can search for so, this so verse. Say that again. Say that again. So from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven is breaking through. Uh, yeah, the kingdom of heaven is breaking through, and the breakers through, which is the title those that break through gets, the breakers yeah. through break through with it. Um, and for instance, if you take this verse and you search for it on Google, and then you add Micah to, uh, you, you'll find. And I can also add this. Um, I could share this also, but it's okay. This is not the point. It's just that. So the breaker is is John, uh, and yep. of course he's also he's also referenced and prophesied about um, in that next. Um, so Isaiah forty three, just the voice of him, and that's the lesser, yeah, right there. The voice of him that cry in the wilderness. That's also what he. I think he uses of himself, and it says about him. It says prepare you the way of the Lord, which is uh -huh. the greater. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, where is John's baptism coming from? Uh, if you go to Matthew twenty one twenty three to twenty seven, um, actually the, the Pharisees is asking Jesus where he's getting his authority, and and there's. In the three synaptic gospels with Mark, Luke, uh, and uh, Matthew, this instance, when they're asking this, all of them places it after Jesus is ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey, which is basically for anyone knowing from Zechariah 9.9 uh, 9 says, yep, yep. your king will come riding humbly on a donkey. So mm -hmm. he's, he's declaring himself to be the king of Israel. And so they're asking, where are you getting your authority? And he's saying, Jesus is saying, Okay, I'll ask you one thing. Where did the uh, the baptism of John come from? Was it from heaven or from men? Mm -hmm. And so I think what he's getting at is that, because in another place, I don't, I don't remember by heart the, the verse name, but it says that the, the Pharisees did not get baptized and they rejected the, the God's will for them. And But the... Mm -hmm. the, uh, the other people, they, they, they were baptized and they accepted the will of God. Mm -hmm. So he's asking them, where was it from? And they reasoned, okay, if we say from heaven, so then they say, why didn't you believe him? And if we say from men, we fear uh, the people for they hold John as a, uh, a prophet. But yeah. so it's, it's understood from this that he's barely wailing or veiling the fact that both John's baptism and his authority comes from the same place. Mm -hmm. That is from heaven. Now, I propose, if you go back to that slide, that John's baptism might uh, stem from Ezekiel 36. Uh, and there you have it. Uh, it's actually 24 to 27. Uh, and I think, I think we'll have to take the whole concept or context of Ezekiel 36 into, into consideration when we're saying this. But so... Let's not go to Ezekiel right now, but just that's where I think where it comes from. Now, okay. there, there, was, there is one problem. So is there a problem? Because there's no direct reference to that chapter talking about baptism. 
Okay. But we have we have tons of prophecies about Messiah, which uh -huh. barely gets any mention in the New Testament at all. So just the fact that it's not referenced, um, it's not necessarily a problem. But we have to put this out there. Okay, there is no direct reference, so that's right. That's 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 how it is. But let's go to the next slide. We have uh, John one. Because there, I think we find uh, some very interesting things. Um, and it says that, so if we look at those bolded parts, it says uh, from verse 19, and this is the record of John. And then the priest and Lev Levites came to him and they asked, who are thou? And then they're asking if he's the Christ or if he's Elijah or if he's the prophet. And he's saying, no, 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 no. So he's not the Christ. And of course, he's not Elijah, although Jesus later tells him he is the Elijah that is coming. He's coming in the spirit of Elijah, doing what yeah. Elijah was doing. And he's also not the prophet. Mm -hmm. And this confuses the, the priests and the Levites. So in verse 25, they asked him and said to him, so why? baptizes thou if thou be not christ nor Elijah nor the prophet and now people when they're reading this why baptizes thou i want you to think that whatever john was doing they recognize and and they draw the conclusion or they they put it together that okay john is doing clearly doing something that either christ or elijah or the prophet is supposed to be doing okay because they're asking, why are you doing what you're doing? And he's answering them. And he says, okay, I baptize with water. And then again, he's pointing to Christ. He says, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. And he, and in parentheses, I just put it the greater. It is that's coming after me. And again, he's the lesser John. He's preferred before me and whose true latches I'm not worthy of unloosing or to unloose. And then if we jump to verse 30 and says this so then he's seen jesus and says he's behold the lamb of god he says this is he of whom i said after me cometh the man which is preferred before me for he was before me and i knew him not but that he should be manifest to israel therefore am i come baptizing with water and john be record saying i saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode on him and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize. So God has sent John to baptize with water. The mm -hmm. same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So here you again have the this distinction being made that God has sent John to baptize with water. And John is witnessing and saying, okay, here is Jesus. He's the Lamb of God. He's greater than me. And he, I'm baptizing you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Yeah, yeah. So I think this is just like face value what we can read. But what we can see is that the the, the priest, they recognize what John is doing. And I think what he's doing is is purifying. He's purifying the, the people that was listening. So he's preaching and he's talking and saying the kingdom of God is near. And if we look at Ezekiel 36, um, and actually that's the next slide, so we can go there. Okay. Now, I would recommend anyone that's listening to this to read the whole chapter from 17. Of course, read the whole thing if you want to, but from 17 to the video end. video not too long ago that I just put out on Ezekiel 36, if somebody wants to watch that for backup too. Yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. So it says... Okay, so the context of Ezekiel 36 is that um, it says, When the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their ways. And it says that their ways before me was the uncleanliness of a removed woman. And this is quite interesting because it was, it was um, um, a removed woman that needed to be purified her whole body. Yep. Uh, and I think so. But at least it's, it's yeah, they're, they're being... They're being what by what they're doing, they're defiling the land. And so God's response is that he scatters them among the heathen. 
in verse 19 and then but he mm-hmm. promises then in 24 that he's will i will take you from the heathen and gather you out of all those countries and bring you into your own land and that's because they they profane his holy name and he's not doing it for them he's doing it for his own name's sake so mm-hmm. that's what he's doing so this is the context actually where john is coming in because israel as you know they uh, was it Ezra and Nehemiah or that, that started building up Israel? I think just 200 years before this. Mm-hmm. So for anyone that had been reading Ezekiel, they knew, okay, we were scattered and now we're come back to Israel. And we have this verse here saying that I will take you from out the heathens and gather you into all countries and will bring you into your own land. And then will I sprinkle clean water from you? And I have John the Lester and question mark. And ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from your idols will I cleanse you. And a new heart I will give you and a new spirit. And that we know that it's Jesus, that his work and what what he's come to do. Now, what kind of hides or kind of let it does because people have this idea that John is immersing the people in water. Mm -hmm. They kind of they they don't see this connection. So that's why when you're looking at the word baptizo or baptismo you don't have to think about this as being immersion because we have other verses in the bible i think they come as the next slide after this but let's take this one first uh, where it actually says that or uses the word as uh, for jews um, purification and it doesn't it has nothing to do with immersion at all mm-hmm. so i would say it's a great I think it's a possibility that this verse is talking about what John is supposed to do, which is sprinkle clean water. Um, and then if you go to verse 31 in the end, it says, then ye shall remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and you shall loathe yourself, which is, I would say, talking about the repentance, um, seeing what they've done, uh, remembering what they've done um, and and loathing themselves for that. So... <laughs> So this, this is the thing, okay, maybe this is where John's baptism is coming from, that God has actually promised to Israel that I'm going to take you back and I'm, gonna, I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you and I'm going to give you a new heart. And so it's, it's very Israel-centric. So and, yeah, that, I, was just about to, I was just about to hit on that, is that the God promised to Israel. So the context of Ezekiel 36 is Israel, Israel, Israel. So your yeah. point, it's Israel-centric. Yes. Um, you and, didn't allow me to steal your thunder. <laughs> no, <laughs> and, and, and that's also what John, in, in John, the, the first chapter of John, what he's saying. So to reveal, uh, was in, in, in 1 John, verse 31, it says that, and I knew him not, but that he should be manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come and baptized with water. So, I think that that's where we have the connection. Now, in order to open up this word baptizo, if you if you jump to the next slide, we have mm-hmm. five instances. No, I think six. Well, it's it's five and a half. So if you have Mark seven point four, there we have when I, we took this up in the session we had also that when they come from the marketplace, yep. they do not eat unless they wash. Uh, yeah, I thought these were very interesting. By the way, these right. are very interesting uses of this word. Now, if baptizo means immerse, then the rabbis or whomever is following this this ordinance, they're getting immersed every time they eat, which I don't Mm -hmm. think is likely. So it's just talking probably about washing of hands or what kind of ritual washings that they had. Uh Or like the washings of cups, pitchers, cuppers, vessels, and couches. And I I don't think, again, it's talking about that they had to immerse them. I think it's it's just talking about washing, which is, that's what, Whomever translated this to English also thought, okay, it just means washing of cups. It hasn't, it doesn't got anything to do with uh, with immersing. And then you have Luke eleven thirty eight again, clearly. Uh, just, there we go. Yeah. So up to the right, because I, let's leave First Corinthians to later. But when the Pharisees okay. saw it, they marveled. He mar- uh, they marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Now, some translation even translate this as he had not performed the, the hand washing, the ritual hand washing before dinner. So they even throw that into it because they're connecting it to 
um, the hand washing that Jews had before dinner. And this is talking about Jesus and he's not doing it. And again, I, I don't think it's talking about God yeah, because Jesus did not immerse his hand because that would have been, uh, they would have poured water over, over the hands. Um, and then we have Hebrews 9, 9, which... Uh, I kind of want to pause for a second here and just... Uh -huh. um, there are a lot of Baptists in the crowd who might be hearing what you're saying, and they might think uh, sometimes like when a Christian talks to an atheist, they uh, they do something called smuggling Jesus in, you know? <laughs> Where, yeah. So a lot of people might be... Li once they start hearing you say it doesn't necessarily mean immersion, it's there's probably a lot of listeners out there trying to say, well, Christopher is just trying to smuggle sprinkling in, you know, and he's, <laughs> that kind of thing. Good so, point. I, no, I just want to point that out. I want to encourage people to keep an open mind, keep listening. Don't jump to conclusions about, about where this is going. Just try to listen to what's being said and then conduct your own sense making. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think what we said in the beginning was I, I think I might trample on some toes even though I'm not trying to. So I think for the Baptist that might be that I'm I'm questioning the, the immersion and then for Lutherans it might be that I'm questioning the regeneration in water and for someone else it might be something else. And I'm not trying to um yeah, I, I don't wanna offend anyone, but this is this is at least how I see no, it. No, I don't think I think it's very important that we maintain an open dial where people can say what they think they're observing and what you're mm. doing is that and I, I, I want to encourage and foster and give affordances for that to continue to occur so mm -hmm. that's i just wanted to encourage everybody to don't jump to conclusions keep an open mind and let's see where let's let's get exposed to this information because i think it's very rich and i yeah right now hebrews 9 9 to 10 um that one is um okay so is it either warriors various washings or is it various baptisms or baptisms it's it, Depending on the translation, you'll find it, but I think it hints towards because it's Hebrews, so it's written to Hebrews uh, mm -hmm. or to Jews. Uh, so I think this might also be about um, actually about different kind of ritual washings that they had. Now, okay, I don't know which one I'm going to do first, the First Corinthian or John three. Let's do John three twenty two to twenty six. Okay. So that one's. What I think is interesting is that, first of all, it says, After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. And actually, at another place, I don't remember where, you you might remember, it says, but right Jesus after, didn't baptize. Right after this in chapter 4. Right. It says Jesus never baptized right. anyone, so but just his disciples. Let me bring that up just, just in case. Um, we covered this. I think uh, somebody else pointed this out in the last session. Yeah. Right in John chapter four, when the Pharisee, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized. So it's interesting also to see how the Bible uses phrases. It says Jesus baptized more disciples than John. Then it clarifies, well, Jesus isn't the one physically mm. doing the baptism. He's not the actual one doing it, but the disciples are doing it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, for, for what I'm about to say, I think it's very interesting. This says that Jesus didn't baptize anyone because so it's even the Bible makes it clear that Jesus didn't baptize anyone in water, right. which is, this is so, clearly talking about. So that comes right after John three twenty two. So you yeah. say, well, it says he baptized, but then it clarifies right there in chapter four that he's not the actual one doing yeah. it. And then it says that um, now John was also baptizing and I'm on near Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. And then in verse 25, it says, and there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and about Jew and the Jews about purification. And then that yeah. word purification is catharsis. Or, um, I don't remember how it's translated, but it's, it's not, so it's not, it doesn't say baptizo, but it's it says catharsis. Yeah. But the question is, what kind of purification and some people and me included are thinking that they're they're actually a, a dispute of of the baptism john's baptism so that they're actually uh, uh, a dispute about so what's going on and it says and they came to john and said to him rabbi he was with you 
beyond Jordan to whom you have testified. Behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So it, it sounds like that's what it's about. This dispute about using them interchangeably. Yeah. Right. And uh, that's just, okay. That's just what I'm reading that. Okay. It sounds like they're talking about the baptism and now he calls it a purification, which as mm -hmm. we look, that could be what the word also means. Now, mm -hmm. One more, and that's that's uh, <laughs> that's an interesting one. Um, actually, I think it might be good that you pull up the the whatever. Maybe you're using King James version because this is the proposed translation by Hanuk Ben Keshet, and there's a link, and there's a whole uh, paper on why he thinks um, that that it should be translated that. But let's read it like it says in. Uh, if you take it up in, uh, let's say in. Uh, if you could pull it up in, in, in the the web web on the window that you had. Yeah, just a second. So in uh first Corinthians fifteen twenty nine. Yeah. Oh, this one's gonna be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so this is very interesting. He's Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's saying According to, is this King James? This is King James. Right. So he says, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they baptized for the dead? And this has been a verse that has confused very many, very long. <laughs> and and even I think the Mormons, I think they, no, they're they using a, this. Yeah, they got a big proof text on this. They're baptizing yeah. folks for the dead all the time. Yeah. And uh Okay, so I mean, ju let's just read the proposed verse, and I think we're not going to spend too much time on it because you have the paper, and just uh, you're just going to have to go read the paper and see what he's saying. But it says the the proposed translation is otherwise. What do they achieve? Those who themselves are purifying the dead, and it doesn't say the dead, but for the benefit of the dead. If actually the dead are not arising, why then are they themselves purifying them for their benefit? And here you have. The baptizo and the baptisma are read in present tense in indirect middle voice, which is effectively active with subject focus. Both verbs act on an implied object, which is the dead, and the preposition, preposition I don't even know how to pronounce that, emphasizes... Pre preposition, uh, yeah. Preposition, uh, uh -huh. emphasis, emphasize reception of benefit by the dead. Now... Uter, yeah. Yeah, so that that's... that's um, that's a proposed translation, uh, which would be that Paul is talking about Jewish purification uh, of the dead before burial and not about baptizing yourself for the dead, but actually purifying the dead. And um, so it's a question mark and, and there's the paper. And for anyone that's interested, you, could, you can read that. But that would make a lot of sense that because there were Jews scattered around, all that area around in Corinth and so on. And and either you have some Jews that are believing or you have the Gentile Christians that have seen what the Jews were doing. Because this is about the talk about the, the resurrection. And so he's using this as a, as a comment, like what do they, whomever is doing this baptizo, what are they winning if there is no resurrection? Like all these Jews running around purifying these dead bodies with myrrh and aloes and all that kind of stuff. Why yeah. are they doing that if they don't expect them to rise again one day? Exactly. So it's interesting. So I, I want to throw in the um, that that verse has about four million different opinions on what it means. Yeah. But um, I'm just here's another one. In, uh, yeah, I'm going to throw in the way I've always understood. Well, not always understood this, but the way I came to understand it was that this is a argument for the resurrection of jesus christ like if i could go back i'm going to go back to the to the verse here to the summary pass uh probably a summary of and if christ be not raised then your faith is in vain mm -hmm. ye are yet in your sins and they which are fallen asleep in christ are perished so if christ if we if in this life only we have hope in christ we're most miserable so but now is Christ risen from the dead? The whole point is the resurrection of Christ is a big, huge argument for the resurrection of Christ. Um, like in verse 15, we found false witnesses to God because we have testified to God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised, uh, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. So in mm -hmm. other words, if the dead don't rise, then Christ isn't raised. 
and that's a lie. <laughs> and we're testifying yep. falsely. We're false witnesses now. And if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised? And if Christ is not raised, then your faith is in vain. So therefore, if you're getting baptized, you know, be baptized in every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. If you're being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you're being baptized in the name of a dead guy. And if they don't rise at all, then why are you being baptized in the name of a dead guy? Mm. Is, yeah. you know, that, that kind of thing. That's, yeah, I see what you're saying. I don't, taken on that. But I don't agree with you. Just throw that but... out there. No, 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 no. I'm not, saying. I'm not saying that that's the way it is. No, what you're no. saying is very interesting. I just want to. If, if I think you, if, a lot of Baptists would probably come from the perspective that I just presented. So mm-hmm. I wanted it to be voiced so that they're not yelling in their <laughs> from their armchair at home uh, that that isn't being heard yeah. necessarily. No, and, and I, I, I see where you're coming from, and I, I think I think that's also. Okay, I could see how someone could come to that. But if you if you go up a little bit back back to verse seventeen, so uh-huh. uh, so you say, okay, if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and yet ye are yet in your sins. And then he's saying in eighteen, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So he's saying, okay, so then there is no resurrection for you. So if Christ yeah, is not, re- not gonna, resurrected, if he didn't raise, they're not going to raise either. Yeah, then you're not going to be resurrected. And I think that it's that, of course, of course I think that verse is talking about, uh-huh. of course, both G- uh, Jesus' resurrection, but then the coming uh, resurrection of the body. Um, and then, I mean, he's using this, I think. So, th- okay. But I think that he's using this um, Jewish uh, purification of the dead as like, what are these guys doing? These guys doing if if they're not going to be raised? Well, why are they even purifying them? I mean, just throw them in the grave and then let them rot. <laughs> But now they're not because they're, <laughs> they're they're anticipating that they will uh, be resurrected. Absolutely, yeah. Um, no, so what you presented here, I don't I don't know if I've ever actually uh, heard it put that way before. So that's very interesting. Yeah. So I mean, the paper is there. It's it's not horribly long, and and I think he makes a good case for for reading it this way. Uh, of course, if you have this idea that the baptism is just immersion. Then uh-huh. it's gonna sound far fetched, but if 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 we can have this uh, expanded view of what baptizo means, then this is a possibility. So, I, yeah, I would also differentiate that I don't think people who believe in the practice of immersion necessarily believe that every time the word shows up, that that's what it no, no, means. No, 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 I don't think so either. It's just. It's something that's it's very strongly connected with the words, and it might it might prevent someone from seeing a verse in a, in another light yeah, yeah. that you know it might mean. Um, uh, we could quickly take uh, the next slide. It says that one's also quite interested. So this is not from from the Bible. It's from uh, uh, um, what it's called. Uh, so outside the apocrypha. apocrypha yeah right right yeah so there you have so this is in greek but the so it's, it's the it's the septuaginta of the apocrypha and then you have Jude 12 7 and says um and she went out each night into the ravine of baltuloa and bathed at the spring of water and then bathed is it's baptizo and it's translated as bathed and it's not translated as you know she's immersing herself and same with Sirach, 34. So what, what tool do you use to look up Greek words in the Septuagint? So this is this is copied from um, from Hanok's uh, website. So uh, okay, I, think, I see. I, was, I see what yeah, you're saying. I think you could. I think you might be able to. I think you can Probably find it online. I, I don't have a. Yeah. yeah I don't. I don't have yeah, a. Yeah, I know tool it can be found speak. online, but I've noticed that yeah. if I'm trying to look up. The usage of Greek words in the old in the Old Testament that it's it's not as easy <laughs> as it no. is for looking them up in Hebrew or Greek words in the New Testament. Yeah. So no, I, it's this is a little bit harder to check. Um, yeah. I'm actually doing something that maybe one shouldn't do, which is trusting that he's pointing this out the right way. If anyone finds that this is not true, then. Put it in, yeah, put it in the comments. I mean, you're identifying where you're getting it from, though, so that's yeah. important. Uh, and again, uh, the next one was when one baits due to the corpse, and when one touches it again, 
Uh, what did he gain by washing? Uh, yeah. Same, it's from Septuaginta, and it's, it's the baptizer which is used. And then mm -hmm. reigns, four reigns, so Second Kings 5.14, and Naaman went down and immersed himself in the Jordan seven times, according to the word of Elias. Elisa and his flesh returned like the flesh of a small mm -hmm. child. And then they were, they've actually in, so this is the next uh, translation and they uh, translated this as immersed. So there you have, they're thinking, okay, he's, he's immersing himself. Was that the new My, English translation? Yeah. And or... it might be that he it did that, or maybe he's just washed himself seven times. Mm -hmm. So, but these, these were some examples where, Kind of where it, it, it again it points to the effect it points to the washing not ne not necessarily the mode so they're they're getting clean because they're getting washed and baptiza is the word used for washed mm -hmm. um then if we if we kind of do like a link um so let's say so what is this john's baptism like what what's going on and if, if you look at matthew 3 so that's the the one to the right so verse 13 to 15. Then uh, Jesus came to Galilee, to Jordan, to be baptized by John. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. Now I think he's saying, John is trying to forbid Jesus. He says, I have a need to be purified by you, not you by me. But yep. then Jesus is saying something interesting. He says, suffer it to be so now for thus it becometh us to fulfill our righteousness and then he suffered him so why are john and jesus fulfilling and what kind of righteousness are they mm -hmm. fulfilling by jesus being baptized mm -hmm. now the idea is this that israel collectively uh, is unclean because of what they as a people had done in order to get scattered out from israel so it's because of course this is 200 years after they had been scattered and regathered, and none of them had done anything wrong. Like per, they hadn't done the deeds that they, their forefathers and had been kicked out from the land for. But for some reason, John or Jesus thinks that they will fulfill some righteousness by Jesus being baptized by John. And it's not mm -hmm. that Jesus is unclean himself. We know that he was not. He was a lamb without blemish. Yeah. But if it would be, because, I mean, he was also circumcised, and I bet that Jesus did practice some kind of uh, purification rituals yeah, that was yeah. ordained for the whole people. So mm -hmm. so if this is something that, and, and it, it kind of says, it would be good to take this out. Do you remember the verse where it says, but the Pharisees rejected the plan of God from them, but he's, they're rejecting the baptism of John? Um. That wording like, doesn't jump out. I mean, that the Pharisees reject a whole bunch of times. Yeah, let's see, let's see if I can find it because I think that one kind of also puts some. Um... Let's uh, let's see Luke seven thirty here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that that's the one. Luke seven thirty. <clears throat> All right, I'll bring that up on the screen. And it says, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized by him. So it seems yep. like God wants them and the whole of Israel to be baptized. Uh, yeah, and there it says the, the publicans justified God being baptized yep. with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees uh -huh. did not. So it seems like everyone did it. Now, if everyone had to do it, then Jesus also had to do it. And that's why he's being baptized by John. And I think that's, again, we're looking at, I think, a purification ritual. Uh, and I think it's an end time messianic purification ritual for Israel as a preparation for the coming kingdom. Yep. And and th I think that's what that they're doing. Sense, yep. Okay. Uh, what's the next one? Got uh, Jesus. We have, yeah, we don't have that many. Yeah, we. Um, so it's, it's slide fourteen. Slide fourteen. Yep. I'm gonna make this bigicator. Yeah. There we go. 
I think you're you're still at the. Oh, oh, um, <laughs> I forgot to change the screen over. Good, thanks for pointing that <laughs> <I'm> out. From... <laughs> so then we have um, the famous discussion, and and um, we have the whole chapter of three of John, but we have the famous discussion of Jesus and Nicodemus, and then yep. Jesus is saying, "Okay, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man is born." be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom kingdom of god mm -hmm. and and okay nicodemus doesn't understand this and some commentators will actually point back to ezekiel 36 and say it reminds yep. of this because you have the water and you have the spirit mm -hmm. i propose that jesus is saying to nicodemus that yeah this is in fact what what i'm saying you have to be born again or born from above and that happens by water and by spirit and this is for israel mm -hmm. mainly uh that's the context where jesus is getting it and i know you pointed out in romans 15 it says jesus is sent to the israel and paul is sent to the gentiles yep. so jesus is talking to israel to nicodemus and nicodemus is a uh rabbi or, or leader of israel and and he's saying okay you have to be born of water and of spirit and after this um well first of all what i'd like to point out because some people um or some people think that what we're practicing today is not john's baptism but that it's a new universal water baptism which is done in in the name of the father and the son and the son and the holy spirit mm -hmm. I'm arguing that there, I can't find this new universal baptism. The only thing I can find is John's baptism in water and Jesus' baptism in spirit, and that these two are never put together. And what I would like to point out is if we're still in John 3 and from verse 22, it says, After these thing, things came, Jesus and his disciples I went into the land of Judea and there tarried with them and baptizing. So we already read this before. But what so I would like to pause just for a second. I want to get right huh? back to that, but I want to pause just for a second because there's going to be a bunch of people yelling at the screen right now because they want this to be pointed out. Um, what Christopher is saying here is that this water here could be a reference, and I'm in John 3 5, could be a reference back to the water of Ezekiel 36. A lot of. Uh, evangelicals will say that this water here is restated down here mm -hmm. that which is born of flesh is flesh so must yeah. be born of water and of the spirit and then down here born of the flesh that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit so a lot of people would say that born of water is like um, a woman's water breaks and she gives birth to a baby so it's just talking about a fleshly birth and a spiritual birth so I just want to voice that opinion out there because there's probably a bunch of people yelling it at the screen. Um, <laughs> if that no, opinion doesn't good. get doesn't make representation, but but you're saying that this water might be a reference back to Ezekiel 36. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. Okay. So let me just go back uh, and uh, let's pick up back where you were. Right. <laughs> so so okay. So what I'm saying is that I don't think there is a new universal christian water baptism that jesus commanded mm -hmm. because i think now after this so after this discussion he has with john it says that uh he tarried with his disciples and they were baptizing in, in chapter four as we said it says that jesus didn't himself baptize anyone but they're baptizing and and in verse 24 it says john was not yet cast into prison mm -hmm. and that's only important when we look at Luke 3.20 and then Luke 7.29, because in Luke mm -hmm. 3.20, it says John is thrown into prison. So whatever mm -hmm. is happening in, in John 3.24, where Jesus is baptizing it with his disciples and, and John is baptizing with his disciples, is, right. uh, is happening before John is in, is in prison. And then you have Luke 3.20, John is thrown into prison. And then you have Luke 7.29, and then it says, and all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. So that means that the baptism with Jesus and his disciples are practicing is John's baptism. That's very interesting to point that out. Right. So, so maybe it could mean 
that they had being baptized. I'd, I'd be interested to look that up. That's an aorist, mm-hmm. passive participle, plural, nominative, masculine. Yeah. Um, it'd be interesting if that means that they had already been that could baptized be. with the baptism of John and were following the person John told them to follow, which is Jesus. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's that's very interesting to point that the order of things out that by the time John seven twenty nine is spoken or written down there, that John had been in prison for four chapters already, mm-hmm. and at least the it doesn't say that that they were baptized with the baptism of Jesus. And right, what I right. think is interesting is that Jesus publicly. I would say endorses the the baptism of John. Yeah, it looks, as it looks like they're getting baptized there. They hear Jesus and are baptized with the baptism of John there on the spot. Is what it looks like. At the immediate, yeah, yeah, apparently. that yeah, it, that's what it looks like. And it doesn't look like he's commanding a new baptism. And, and what's interesting, we're talking about Luke. If, if you read Luke from the beginning to the end and then jump straight into Acts, beginning to the end, there is no new command from Jesus for a new kind of baptism except for the one in spirit. Yeah. Because the com- what people think is the command for a new baptism is from Matthew 28, 19, or, or the end of, of 28. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just about to ask so you about I'm, that. Yeah, so Jesus uh, and his disciples did not proclaim a new or higher water baptism. Instead, they continued with John's baptism because if John's baptism was from Jesus or was from heaven, from God, there was nothing wrong with it. And they continued to do and and, um, perform the baptism of John. But now, after after the, um, the, the Pharisees and the lawyers had questioned Jesus about his authority, he even give, gave it greater. Uh, emphasis and saying, okay, okay, he's barely veiling and say, my authority and John's baptism comes from the same source. But you reject, you know, they, they rejected both. Yeah, so uh, he's asking, where's the baptism of John from? That has direct implication to what Jesus is doing too, then. Yeah, yeah. yeah th- so that, yeah, that's the whole point where, why we're even asking the question where it comes from. Now, if you jump mm-hmm. to the next slide, mm-hmm. there we just have the same that. If you read Luke and Acts, uh, there's only two John, two baptisms. You have the John in water and Jesus with spirit. And mm-hmm. again, this this is significant, as you know, and maybe for the one listening, is that those two books or letters or whatever has the same author, which is Luke, was writing down these testimonies, both from, you know in Luke and then in Acts, later in Acts. And he doesn't mention a new baptism. And what's interesting is that John's baptism continues to be mentioned in Acts, in Acts 10.37, which is Peter going to Cornelius and says, that word I say, you know, which was published throughout all of Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism with which John preached. But it's interesting that there is no mention of Jesus' water baptism. And so he's still talking and he's talking to Cornelius about John's baptism. Yeah. And then in Acts 13.24, now, there's so much to say about these. I have, kind of have to jump because we've already almost spent two hours on it. But uh, <laughs> Acts 13, 24, it's, it's Paul being uh, talking to the Jews in a synagogue. And he's saying, when John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Again, it's connecting the baptism of repentance, which is John's, to the yep. people of Israel. Yep. And again, no new mention of any Jesus baptism. And I think there's a problem with importing Matthew 20, 18 to 20 into the Luke Acts narrative. Because I think the the the, the verses in Matthew 28 and 18 to 20 is being misunderstood. And so the question is, we're looking at Acts, which is the pred- paradigmatic, uh, paradigmatic guiding statement in Acts? Is it Acts 1, 5? Or is it Peter's Acts 2, 38? So is it Jesus saying, John baptized with water, but you will in some days be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Or is it um, repent and be baptized with water and then you'll receive the Holy Spirit? So which is the paradigmatic guiding statement? I think it's Acts 1.5. Oh, is yeah, pap- definitely. I think right. um, Acts 2.38 is, well, it's reworded in Acts 3.19 where Peter doesn't even say that way, but it's no. Peter doesn't really get the gist of Acts 1.5 until 
Acts eleven fifteen through sixteen, yep. ten chapters later. So he doesn't, right. and then and then remembered I how the word of the Lord said John deep exactly. baptized with water. So it clicks in. Then he then he gets it. Oh my, what's going on there? And so, right. uh, if I could pause there and ask you ask you a question real quick, uh, sure. I'm finding what you're saying to be very intriguing, as I did before. So, uh, if that's John's baptism, if we go to Acts 19, and, I, and if this is already in your slides, I apologize if I'm stealing your thunder by jumping forward to this. It's not, but, but we could come back to it. So, Paul comes across and he finds... Uh, he comes to Ephesus, finds certain disciples, and he says, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? Yeah. And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this... They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yep. So in verse 5, what took place in verse 5? So the way I see it, so first of all, Paul is very concerned with them receiving the Holy Spirit because I think he understands yep. the importance of that. So you have some disciples. It doesn't say, are they John's disciple or are they disciples of Jesus? So the way. Because you have Apollos before in the chapter before, and he, he has knowledge yep. of the way. But he yep. only knows John's baptism. And then yeah, he had to have the way of God expounded him more perfectly. Yeah, by Aquila and Priscilla. And it does uh, not say that he got baptized. It does not. It just says that he doesn't he wasn't aware of that and they they um they they speak more. Yeah. Exactly. Whom then? So he only took knew him. the baptism of John. Yeah. They explained the way of God to him more perfectly. Right. And then and, uh, and then yeah. you have next chapter again and you have those disciples. Now if we the way I look at it is that when they heard this, they were baptized. And that, first of all, doesn't say that Paul baptizes them. It says they were baptized, which is, if you look into this, uh, I think that after Cornelius, I think the, the focus changes on how it's happened. It's like before Cornelius, someone is doing the baptizing. Um, I don't remember the grammatical, like how, how, how they use the words. But then after Cornelius, it's just they were baptized. It's like yeah, yeah. it doesn't say that anyone is doing it, just says they were baptized. Um yeah, yeah. so I think verse okay, if we scroll down a little bit, so I have five, six, and seven um on the screen. It says, When they heard this, they heard this, which is the same as Cornelius. When they heard this, they were baptized. And it says in, which is ace in Greek. And it could also mean in two, which I yeah, I find too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I find that to be more convincing. They were baptized into the name of Lord Jesus, which is what happened with Cornelius when he heard what Peter was mm -hmm. saying. So verse 5 is, is is stating what happens. Verse 6 is stating so how it happened. So this is kind of like, uh, this is this looks exactly like what happened to Cornelius. And before, before Peter said, can any man forbid water, these should be baptized, he was filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke yeah. with tongues. So yeah. You're saying that this same thing that happened to Cornelius is happening to these guys. Well, I, I, I absolutely think that it's a possibility that verse 5 is stating what ha what is happening. Verse 6 is stating how it happens, which is Paul laying his hands on them and Holy Spirit came on them. And then verse 7 yeah, is, the, is talking about whom it happened Paul to. Paul laid his hands on them. It doesn't, yeah. uh, it doesn't take the time to say that Paul did any, you know, dipping in any water or anything. Yeah, that that's that's one comment. Um and I think, I think, um, yeah, that's that's how I see it. It doesn't necessarily have to be that they're being baptized in water again. Like, I mean, what's the point? And I'm, I just I can't see it in the text that that he would have bothered uh, with another baptism. I mean, the the hundred and twenty yeah. that received the Holy Spirit, if any anything, I think they had been baptized with John's baptism. I mean, they were not, I think, baptized again in another. I, I think it doesn't even, I don't know if it even says that they were baptized. I assume that they had been baptized with John's baptism. But I'm finding it hard to believe that John would have gone about doing another dipping into the water or or, or water baptism. Yeah, that's, um, that's, 
That's, that's good things to be pointed out. Interesting. Uh, um, I just brought the slides back up. Yeah. Next slide. That that's the. <laughs> I think that that's a very interesting one. Um, again, very small, and I put some colors here because I wanted to to kind of tie something with the text. Now let's let's just read it the first and just say okay. So and Jesus came and spake unto them and saying, "All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore." And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Now, so I have these um, things here um, in, in the brackets or in the parentheses. It's the name, it's revelation, it's baptizing and teaching. It's not a ritual forma, it's ace. So first of all... Um, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, you can see those John mm -hmm. 17 and verse 6, 12, mm -hmm. and 26. It says, I have manifest manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them, and they have kept thy word. Mm -hmm. And then 12, which while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me, and I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that scripture might be fulfilled. And then 26, and I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, what he's saying is that he's revealed the name of God to the disciples. And I'm assuming and I'm um, that it's by what he was teaching and, and the way he was living. He says, anyone has seen me, has seen the son, has seen the father. So the name God's name is being manifested or revealed to them by what he's teaching. Mm -hmm. um, some people think that where it says that you should pray about something in the name of Jesus, that you should say, okay, I, I pray whatever I pray, and then you end with in the name of Jesus. But yeah. what it actually is pointing to, uh, this might be obvious to someone, is that by the authority and teachings of Jesus, we should pray. And if we pray according to his will and as, as he has taught us to pray, then we are praying in the name of Jesus. You don't even okay. have to say in the name of Jesus. You can say, well, you can pray, it's, Father, it's, give me. It's the mode of how you're doing it. It's not necessarily that you say it. Yeah. Right. So if, if I pray that, um, uh, Father, give me the Holy Spirit, uh, I, I, pr I pray that you would give me the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. then you're praying in the name of Jesus because Jesus actually commanded people to pray to receive the Holy Spirit or, pray, mm -hmm. you know, to pray about certain things. And that's praying in his name, which is doing it mm -hmm. by his authority because he said, do this. And if you do it, you're doing it in his name. So what he's saying here, I think, is that, first of all, we talk about what the baptizo might mean, which is uh, purify, uh, wash, cleanse it does mean immerse it does mean all of these things um first of all um moses if you go to x well you don't have to go there but um oh, I, I already have it exodus 34 yep. 6 there we go uh it says and the lord passed by him by before him and proclaimed the lord the lord god merciful and gracious long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth now what's very interesting i find is that when the disciples are with him on that mountain because it says they should go to the the mountain in matthew 28 they're up on a mountain and jesus mm -hmm. is giving them revelation you have moses up on the mountain and he's receiving revelation from god and god tells him his name which is the lord the lord god and there you have jesus teaching his apostles and i think for the first time tying together the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost uh, mm -hmm. to the disciples. And he's saying you should baptize them in. Now the question is, and this is, um, I think, quite interesting. If you're looking at textual variances, how this is translated, some translate it into baptize them into the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, and some uh -huh. says baptizing them in. So the question in is the, baptizing the Greek them. Word is ice. Yeah, yes. A, so, so is it in a like a form? It could go either way, yeah. Yeah. Is it, is it in like a formula or is into more of like, um, you know, the heathens, the Gentiles outside the nations, they don't know about God. Uh, and you have these apostles and Jesus is saying them, you should go to them and you should baptize them into 
which is revealed the 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 name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Because the question which has been asked many times is that no one is baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost in the Acts. They're just they baptized in the name of Jesus the Messiah. Right. Yeah, you don't actually see that formula for no. people getting dipped in water out of Matthew 28 in the book of Acts. Right. Uh, next thing is, if you point that out, is bat both baptizing and teaching is present active participle. So it's like an is, ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing from apostle to disciple. or So to, d to disciple someone in Christ is to baptize them in Christ. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's clear with the teaching that that wouldn't be a punctilar like one point in what one time, but that's something that happens and then continues. Event, yeah. Right. But again, mm -hmm. that's the same kind of mode which they've used the baptizing them in into the name of the Father and the Son. Um, now, this is not understood as we discussed in this, this last session by the apostles before Cornelius happens. So, and, and just in case anybody's curious, I am uh, double checking these uh, parsings, and that, that is correct. This present active participle. Yeah. Anyway. So, another thing that I would like to point out is in First Corinthians uh, chapter one, verse seventeen. You have uh -huh. the Paul, which is the chief apostle to the Gentiles, and he's stating that Jesus did not send me to baptize you. Mm -hmm. Or to baptize, but to preach the, the gospel. So it's looking at this and looking at actually, I mean, of course, there's so much more to say. I mean, we're just barely scratching the surface here, but I'm saying that. Um, so the last slide I have, I think we have two slides left. Uh, I don't know which one we should to pick. I have First Peter 3. <laughs> I think that was very interesting. And well, then. Yeah, I wanted to say some things about First Peter three too, but I was three also, not First Peter three too, but First Peter three yeah. also. I, it's, it's interesting that we're having this conversation now because I was planning on doing the ne the Sunday session mm -hmm. on Acts one five, uh, Acts eleven fifteen through sixteen, and First Peter three twenty one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. That, I was yeah. going to go there anyway. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, we, yeah, we are, I think we, we have gone a good way. So if we could, um, let's try to hit the, let's try to hit these main points. Right. Let's take the last slide. I think, I think I can close this off and, and, um, so we, we don't drag it out. This last I, slide. I still, I still want to know what you want to say. Can you summarize quickly? Your yeah. You know, I'll, I'll let, yeah. let's see those five. I just comment shortly and then let's go back to first Peter. Uh, okay. So, um, Hanuk Ben Keshet has actually, um, yeah, he has a paper which is called "Testing the Waters: Five Sayings mm -hmm. by Jesus on Baptizo." Now, mm -hmm. what I've done here, I've just copied his proposed alternative alternative translations for all of those verses. So it says just instead of Luke twelve fifty, it's that one reads um, in King James. It reads, "I have a baptism to be baptized with." Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and so Hanukkah is, is proposing that it says, I have an ordeal to be overwhelmed with and how distressed I am until it's completed. And then Mark I, I 10. I, I, doesn't, I don't even think that's a bad translation. I mean, the baptism of suffering, in other words. Yeah. 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 And then Mark 10, 38, 39. I, he proposes that it's a, it's a Hebraism, which is that, so a Hebraism is saying, first you say, um, you say, uh, a example a and then you say b and b is uh making whatever you said in a stronger so he says can you drink the cup that i drink of or the drunkenness which i am drunk in, can you be drunken because mm -hmm. so what we're looking at was baptizo was used as being drunk um right and so that that's something else um and then you have mark eleven thirty, luke 24 and then matthew 21 25 which is again he's they're questioning him about his authority, and he's, and then he's saying, okay, I'll answer you, but answer me first. Johanan's pur purification right, was it from heaven or from man? So that, that's the proposal. And then we just went through the Great Commissioning, which is, was Jesus really saying that they should go out and baptize Gentiles in water, or was he saying something else? Because all of those three sayings of Jesus has nothing to do with immersion in water. 
the the, right. the one the three before, and then Acts one twenty five says, "For Johanna I'm purified with water, but you will be purified with the Holy Spirit not many days from now." What one five? Now, yeah, right. So yeah, that's the proposed. <laughs> yeah, it's the proposed translation, and he has a paper, and I'll I'll give you. Um, uh, we can put in the, the, the sources to these papers uh, for anyone that wants to go and read this. So let's take, so we, let's we look at. We probably should have said this at the very beginning of the session. But yeah. when you see the word purified, what you're looking at is a translation of the word. Mm -hmm. When you see the word baptism, you you need to realize that you're looking at a translate. I'm saying this for all the benefit of all the listeners out yep. there. You're not looking at a translated word. You're looking at a transliterated word. And a yep. transliterated word takes the word baptizo in Greek and just tries to spell those same sounds in English. So they're not yep. translating the word. They're just giving you a Greek word is what they're doing. Um, so when you look over here and you see purification and purified or overwhelmed or these kinds of things what what you're seeing is somebody translating the word instead of just transliterating it instead of yeah. just spelling out the same sounds from the original language in english they're actually trying to translate the word the meaning of the word into an equivalent word in the new language so we probably maybe should have led with that concept, but the word baptism is not a translated word. It is a Greek word. It is a transliterated word, baptizo. And so what one of the things that we're trying to do in this session is let's look at translating the word into what it means in English when we would see it rather than just use the transliteration because the transliteration really is kind of vague and doesn't really help us because it's not an English word. Yep. All right. I've said that soapbox. Yeah. So, so what I found now, in order to kind of make sense of what it, what what Peter is saying here, is that it would be would be good to kind of go through uh, Acts chapter chapter ten and eleven. But what I'm proposing, uh, what anyone listening, what they should do is that they should read chapter ten and eleven. And realize that God is saying when He's giving that vision to Peter, He's saying, "Whatever God has declared cleansed or clean, you shouldn't say is profane." And that that's kind of the the context for the whole chapter ten and eleven. So you have so you when have, God has cleansed because He gave Him the Holy Spirit and He started speaking in tongues. Why would you call it unclean and try to wash them with water anyway? Yeah. Well, no, no, um, oh, yeah, okay, that, that that would be the implication of kind words, of like what, yeah. so what, you're, may, what you're reading so out. The, but... lesson, the lesson isn't over when Peter is just giving the gospel to Cornelius, but we see that Peter's still learning the lesson when he says, see here is water, what doth hinder them to be baptized? Yeah. Right after that. Well, maybe there's no need for that. That That's the question. Because but... the Holy Ghost already purified them. They're are, I mean, they're already saved. Right, but if, so, if you read... Chapter so maybe ten, he's being verse, reactionary there. Yeah. If you read chapter ten, verse fifteen, and it says the so that's the voice speaking to Peter, and it says the voice spake unto him again the second time, and it says what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. So so yep. that's that's uh, directly what the voice is saying to Peter because it's trying to teach him something. Um, and then. Okay, he doesn't know why he's going to Cornelius because he doesn't apparently he doesn't understand what we're, what Jesus had said in the Great Commission. Yep. Uh, so he goes there and he talks to Cornelius and the spirit falls on them when they're listening. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, what does it mean in chapter eleven, verse sixteen? I think it's fifteen or sixteen when it says, "Then remembered I," because. So Peter goes back to the Jerusalem in, in beginning of chapter eleven, and he's attacked for having defiled himself with uh, with Gentiles, and he's saying, "Hey, listen, wait, I think I've realized something." So because he had that vision, and he went there, and and all of the Jews that were with him, they were surprised that the Gentiles received the Spirit. And then, now we've been looking at John's baptism as a purification rite. Which is, I think, what I mean. This this 
this thought about defilement and being pure and being clean is on the minds of not only Peter, but all of the other Jews also. I mean, they don't, they didn't stop living as Jews. So they're just standing there absolutely confused and amazed that these Gentiles also received the baptism in the spirit. And yeah. they just listened and they believed and then God baptized them. So whatever baptized means, I think it means that he purified them. Now, John that or Peter that doesn't know really what's going on, he's he's um he asks, okay, can anyone forbid that these are also baptized with the water? The water, it's it's not just any water, uh, the water. I think it's pure water he's talking about, uh, which is also what we would find in in Hebrews it says. I should have put that in a memory now. I think it's Hebrews. Seven. Which one are you looking for? Uh, Hebrews ten twenty two. The question: If if that if um, if that's a reference to baptism or not, it says, "Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water." Now, any mm -hmm. Hebrew reading this pure water would. Think back to Leviticus uh, chapter 11, verse 32, which specifies what is pure water. Now, I don't think any Christian would say that there's a need that all Christians that's ever been baptized with water have to be rebaptized because they didn't use pure water. But I think that the Jews <laughs> back then was using, I think Peter and the apostles, and disciples, they were using pure water. Like, why would they forego the practice that had been set up and that had been in place in, since Moses? Mm -hmm. So it's actually in 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 the end of uh, chapter ten it says what can hinder the water. So it's it's um what's it called? I don't know what it's called grammatically. Like it's the water. Uh, if you go read the um, article, yeah, definitive. Yeah. So okay, he comes back. They attack him that he that he's defiling himself with the Jews. Now, what actually puts this altercation to the grave is so his mia culpa is. Then remembered I what Jesus had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with yep. spirit. And so he's saying, who was I that I could hinder? Now, some people will say, I couldn't hinder God by not baptizing them with the water. Yep. But I think he's saying, who was I that could withstand God, that God baptized them with the spirit? Now, if... This is the understanding. So let's now go to 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. If yeah. this is the understanding that Peter actually gets that it's, ah, okay, he understands that it's the, the spirit baptism is the greater one. Now, this is very interesting. Now, if you look at it, so we have verse 20 and 21. It says, which sometimes were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, were in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Mm -hmm. So he's taking, okay, here's the example. It says, according to the same figure. So, and it says, the, this is the antitypo in Greek. This antitypo, where unto even baptism doth now also now save. Now, if we take a transliteration of. Um, Let's see here. I think, did I have it on the slide? I think it, I have it on the slide. Yeah, let me uh, let me bring the slide up. Yes. So this, uh, under this list of answer, pledge, interrogation, appeal, whatever, here's just translated or really, really roughly directly translated from Greek. It says, which also an antitype now saves us, baptism. And then it says, not of flesh, a putting away of filth. And which is, so I think Peter is trying to say, so, so now baptism saves us. Not the baptism, which is the putting away of filth of the flesh. Yeah, it's very clear. Not the right. putting away of the filth of the yeah, flesh. Yeah, so he's saying, so and so this is Peter, and it's First Peter. So I think First Peter is written actually to Jews. It's not written to Gentiles. Yep. I think I think I think we can make a really strong argument that it's written to Jews, believing Jews. And he's saying, okay, so now the baptism that does says it's not the one that's putting away filth. 
but it's the other one. Uh, and then there's there's a strange word. It's epero, eperotema, which yeah. has been translated in four different ways. Uh, King James, it's an answer, it's a pledge, it's, it's an interrogation, or it's an appeal. Now, an answer or a, or a pledge. Now, bo both of these, let's answer and pledge, that's kind of like um, people who understand it like that, they both of them think that it's a water baptism. But they say, okay, because God has cleansed me, because I've... Because God has given me a good conscience, then the water baptism is an answer or a pledge. And then mm -hmm. the other the other ways is that it's an inter interrogation or an appeal to God. That the water baptism is an interrogation or an appeal. Mm -hmm. But what if it falls in the middle of those two, which is an appeal to a higher authority for a good conscience? And that is the baptism that saves, which is someone hearing the gospel and appealing to God for a good for a clean conscience and then God answering them with the spirit of the whole with the baptism of the spirit because if if this if if the the eight people that were saved in the ark and the baptism that saves is to have any resemblance if if one is going to be um uh a figure for the other one actually what happens is that um, with Noah, th they go into the ark. They are not even touching the water. But what d God does is that he sends water from heaven and it pours and down. He's stealing my thunder. Right. But then <laughs> the baptism that saves is the one where a person is appealing to God for a good conscience and he answers like God did with Noah with pouring out his spirit from heaven. Yeah. So there you would have kind of the the resemblance or where it's it's a figure which is that in both God is pouring out something from heaven and it's the it's the holy holy spirit that is poured out and that anyone who appeals to God who names the name of Jesus does not have to stand there with chain but that God that God will um answer them. So in in closing I well, before you close, I want to jump on a couple of things real quick right. on First Peter three twenty one, and you already said a lot of them to begin with. But I want to I want to point something else out that in for um, I just moved this window like it's moving for you too, <laughs> like it is saying in First Peter three twenty he goes back to the days of Noah, mm -hmm. right. Whereas in eight souls were saved by water. So I want to pause for just a second and let's look at what's going on in the days of Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, you got the Nephilim and the giants, a bunch of crazy stuff's going on. And God saw that the wickedness of man, Genesis 6, 5, was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Mm -hmm. So the man is wicked and you got evil thoughts in his heart continually and he repented the Lord that he had made man on earth and it grieved him from the heart. So how long could you survive in a place like that where everybody who's alive is wicked and only evil continually? How long could Noah and his family survive there? You know, it's probably just a matter of time before the wickedness overwhelmed them and mm -hmm. got them to either fall morally or start participating in it or they get killed. You know, they get destroyed. So in 1 Peter 3.21, 1 Peter, when the ark was preparing, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The idea here is not that the water did any, not like it was sacramentally conferring grace to anybody, but it wiped out all the wicked people that would have killed it, saved them. Imagine someone's breaking into your house and, you know, a flood happens to wipe, wash them away and save you. It, it, it acts as the superhero and it saves it sa it saves them mm -hmm. from from the situation that they're in and the thing that I point out to people is that of the entire globe they're the only ones not in the water yeah and that's the figure of the baptism that saves yeah <laughs> so if if you were to be a baptismal regenerationist, and when I say that, that that is a description of people who believe that 
you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Catholics believe that, Church of Christ believe that, a bunch of Pentecostals believe that, and then there's varying degrees of how it's practiced. Um, you could call me a baptismal regenerationist if you're not talking about water baptism. Mm. But <laughs> so if you believed that you had to be, we call these people uh, the Church of Christ, our friends over there, we call them the Lord's Navy, you know, <laughs> affectionately. But if you believed that you had to be dunked in water to be saved, you would really love this phrase, baptism. And here's what you'll actually hear them say. You'll actually hear them say in online. See, I used to do the street evangelism stuff where you encounter these people face to face all the time. And you would hear them say this phrase, baptism doth also now save us. Baptism doth also now save us. They'll, they'll repeat just that phrase. Mm-hmm. I don't have that up on the screen, do I? <laughs> You got to tell me this again. Uh, I've been going all the uh, way through Genesis and First Peter, <laughs> but your your audio just is sounding weird now. It might be my. All right, I'm gonna try to address that in just a second. Um, it said you'll hear them say this phrase: "Baptism doth also now save us," over and over and over again. But without any of the context, they're not looking at Genesis 6, they're not looking at any of this stuff, and they don't realize that they're the only ones who did not go into the water, and they don't, they don't realize that it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, and they don't see the word figure. There's so many things they have to ignore just to single out, and that is a case of eisegesis where you already have a conclusion formed in your mind, and you're looking for a phrase to justify that conclusion when you go to Scripture, and then you find this convenient phrase which backs up the thing that you want to preach and teach, not something you found in Scripture in the context. Anyway, so that's uh, that's my spiel real quick on 1 Peter 3.21. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to go back to your slide. And uh, Your audio is real bad. I don't know. Say something again. <laughs> yeah, it's, hold on. I'm going to take off my earbuds and see if I, uh, maybe it's my AirPods that are that are causing this problem uh, say something again testing testing must have been my airpods because now you sound great okay maybe they were done no battery left in those things right <laughs> yeah I, I i think you're um i i agree with you there's there's a lot that you have to foresee or or look past in order to to get it to okay this is this is water it's water baptism and and one thing also to point out is that um translations are not free from theological presuppositions right right so you got so, people so you, yep so they're they're and i i i think that when they tried to translate it i think they really wanted to capture what the greek was saying if they were thinking that Peter is talking about water baptism. That might uh, affect how they they phrase or or put something. I mean, they're not doing this uh, by any um, by intent or anything. But if they if that that's their understanding, that might also affect. And just one example, and of course, it's going to be hard for you to check this. But there's a, a Swedish translation. Uh, it's called uh, 1917 translation. Uh, where they actually into verse twenty one, it says uh, they e- they put the word water in Swedish in there, even though it doesn't it doesn't exist in the uh, in the Greek text. But they say uh, the like figure where I, where even water baptism does now save us or water yeah. saves. Us. So I mean, they put that water the word water in there, even though the the Greek text doesn't mention it. So it's like, but the funny thing is. And it's, it's, I'm a little bit sad that I can't show you this because it wouldn't help anyone except for those that speak Swedish. Now, if you take that 1917 translation and remove those two words, which is the water, which is it's not in there, I think it's one of the... Uh, let's see. Okay, you actually have it there. No. That's, I think it's, I think, because it, it's, I, it should be, was that, was, was this the 1917? Um, I got 1917, it's saying, uh, 
Yeah, so, because, because I think it's jump the versus or something because it's that's not. I think I think it actually does it come versus after this also. Can you yeah, get that up um, on the screen? Because well, I think I'm having sometimes the the verse numbers between Swedish and English won't match. Yeah, that makes sense. For some reason, because that's not the. I think uh, is this. Oh, but you know what? No, you're not. Yeah, uh, the wrong chapter or something. That's right. I am in the wrong chapter. So now I'm. <laughs> Let me see if I can go into the right chapter. How's that? Yeah, that that's the right. Now, for anyone reading Swedish, um, uh, so it says in Just in uh, case anybody okay, asks, when somebody asks me what my perverted right. version of the Bible is, you tell them Swedish. Yeah. So, so you have verse twenty and twenty one, and and twenty one it says. After after then a forebill believe and okay first you know button and this water button yep. I mean it doesn't even says there. Yeah. But what it says after this, and I'll translate it to English, it says, namely through a baptism, which does not mean that you wash the body from filth, but means that you call to God for a clean conscience. Yeah. So that's that's what it says. But it's actually, I think, a very good translation if you take away this. Uh, true water, which is yen on vatten. True water. If you take away that, which is it's not in the it's not in the the Greek text, no, so it Greek, doesn't matter so if you take it away. It right. The sweet, the yeah, <laughs> the Swedish version. Right. If you take that away, it actually reads like uh, we are being saved by a baptism that does not mean that you wash away filled, but means that you call God for a clean conscience. Yeah. It's very interesting. So why uh, have you looked into why they would add that true water in there? Did they get that out of Hebrews ten twenty two and just like in, interpolate it back in there? What you know? What's the deal there? I I think so. I think the translator tried. So they were thinking that he's talking about water baptism, and they're putting that in to make that clear. Oh, okay. I think <laughs> so I think I think, that's, I think that's what happened. So I think I think that's, it's that's a case theology. of uh, making the Bible match your theology rather than getting your yeah. theology from the Bible. Yeah, I think that's the good thing with King James is that it does not do that. Yeah. Uh, and and a lot of other translations will, you have the same going on in Hebrews, actually, where Hebrews... Yeah, so some translations, and even though I'm not a fan of the ESV, it actually does have a good point where it tries to, if it's obscure in the original, it tries to keep it obscure by, yeah. by rendering it faithfully as, as much as it can. At least that's the claim. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no, so... I think, I mean, there's, I know that anyone listening will be, okay, what about this verse and what about that verse? And I, there's, there's many, I think there's 80 references to baptizo and 20 to baptisma uh -huh. in the New Testament. So I know we've just looked at a few, but I've, I, I've looked at all of them. And of course, don't trust me, but I'm saying that we can't cover everything. And now we've almost been two and a half hours, <laughs> but of course, there's more to say, and I, I encourage everyone to, uh, I mean, if there's questions, I mean, put them out, and maybe we'll have, you know, we'll have the discussion. I don't know if, if I joined that many other discussions at 3 a.m. Yeah. I'll try. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, I, we'll put out the sources, and if anyone's interesting to read, uh, that would be something. What, what I would like to say in closing was that, what I find amazing with this is that, at least for me, it kind of it made sense when I started reading it, and I I became uh -huh. almost uh, ecstatic when I when I first saw it. That wow, this is this is something. It's uh, it's very easy. Um, it's very clear somehow when you when you see it. I mean, to to get away the 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 previous theology and 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 and. Uh, thoughts that you might have had that that can be difficult and it's been very difficult for me also but but when i started seeing this what's so amazing about this is that we do indeed have a god which is above us in the father but also at our side in christ um yeah and in us through the spirit and we have an amazing god that 
has come down and he he calls every one of us and anyone listening to 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 uh, call upon his name and and turn to him and and he wants i mean he wants to um sa save us and give us uh give us of his spirit and when i started reading this it just yeah i i was uh i was captured by by this understanding and, and how, how this was put out and and that's why i started looking into it and yeah of course there's there's a lot more yeah. to say and so, so, uh, so, but that's that's short. short yeah, one. I want to say thanks for coming on. You've you've obviously put a lot of effort into looking through this information, which which is amazing. And um, I I almost feel guilty as uh, just being the free beneficiary of sitting here and being able to listen you listen to you go through what you found and discovered. And it's it's a very I found it very insightful, very enlightening. And uh, I really appreciate you for coming on, taking the time to step by step go through this stuff and, and show us the thoughts behind this, because um, this has been an area of interest for mine, per of, of mine personally for a while, because there's so mm -hmm. many different views on baptism. And doing a deep dive like this, I think regardless of the other side where people come out, it's it's very helpful. It's very edifying. Um, I feel like. I've got some insights to work with now that I was not tracking before. I mean, you pointed out some things to me in the text that did not stand out to me before, especially the stuff in, in Luke seven twenty nine and 30, I think mm -hmm. I, I, that never, that I never put those two together before. And I, I really like that. I appreciate that. So this is, this is kind of what I'm trying to foster. I would consider this session of you and I to be part of the full stature initiative. What we want to do is have, um, every joint supplying edification just like in in ephesians chapter 4 verse 16 and you know people say these things like um you got to be careful because some people you know the devil has it's like rat poison it's 98 percent truth and two percent lie but we had we mm -hmm. had to move past that kind of rhetoric and realize that it, no human is completely true and we all have to conduct our own sense making and we all yeah. have to speak the truth in love and as we do that we could be a, a positive you know, self-reinforcing feedback loop that actually helps edify and encourage people to grow. So regardless of what position any of the listeners have on, on baptism, I hope that you feel informed and edified and provoked to study further. I know I do. I, mm -hmm. I'm going to be, I'm going to be digging into some of this stuff, looking into it. And I, just the practice of you, you know, saying what your perspective is. Hey, here's what I see. Here's what I've found. Here's what it looks like to me. It's exactly mm -hmm. what I want all Christians to be doing. So I, I really appreciate you for coming on beyond the fundamentals and, uh, and doing that with us. <laughs> well, I, I likewise, I can say, because you said every, every member or every part, uh, edifies, I think, uh, I watched a lot of your video videos on, on Calvinism and I had a need to know what you were telling and it, it, that was very good for me and I, I felt the same. I just I was I've just been sitting and listening to what you've been saying about Calvinism. It's helped me greatly uh, like a lot uh, of, of seeing those things. I always, you know, had the feeling that something's not right, but then yeah, when yeah. it came to right, so uh, I'm just happy if if anyone finds anything good and even if anyone finds something okay this doesn't make sense because you know it's just good because then you can point it out and then yeah, i mean the best thing that could happen this and it doesn't make sense and then you just you speak it and <laughs> right yeah. and the best thing that could happen for me is that someone points out ah okay but what about this and then it's like oh yeah i missed that yeah. so i've yeah i um i think this is uh, it's a very good thing and i think that um the initiative that you're going on is, um, I think it's very good. Well, yeah, I appreciate, I really appreciate you being a part of this. I'm, I, I feel like I'm starting to see some things bloom as things, uh, as people like you are sharing what you have to say, what your perspective is. I think we're all being edified by each other, which is the intent. <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy yeah. about it. So, um, we've been doing this for about, uh, two hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> I, I guess that's an okay stopping point. I don't know if you need a bathroom break or not. But anyway, we're going to, um, I guess we'll wrap it up right here. 
So thanks, thanks, uh, Christopher, for joining us for, for, and, and presenting this information. Uh, very helpful. And for everybody else out there, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.